Buckner and Elliot Kribbe. Volunteer assistant coach Garrett DeGallier and their graduate student manager is Jaron Silva.
now let's set your hustling rebels defensively. In left field, number 47, Austin Grizzick. In center field, number 25, Rylan Charles. In right field, number 8, Santino Bonaro. At third base, number 2, Idarian Williams. At shortstop, number 23, Paul Myro the fourth. At second base, number three, Gianni Horvat. At first base, number four, Braden Murphy. Behind the plate is number five, Jacob Sharp. And on the mound for the Hustlin' Rebels is number 19, Joey Acosta. At this time, we ask that you please stand and remove your caps and join us for the playing of our national anthem. For the third time in the 2023 season, this is another edition of UNLV Baseball. Along with Dan Dolby, I'm Matt Never coming to you from Earl E. Wilson Stadium on the campus of UNLV for the final game of a three-game opening series between the Hustlin' Rebels and the visiting Tigers of Pacific. UNLV starting the season off 2-0. They'll turn the ball over to Joey Acosta on the mound today, looking for a clean sweep in their 10th win in a row against Pacific. And for Joey Acosta, really stretching things out towards the end of the last year when he got his starting opportunity and looking to continue that momentum here into his second season with the Hustlin' Rebs. Yeah, it's a great day here at the ballpark. Another, another sunny day. You know, when you're looking at a scheduled preseason, you're looking at the, the, the series that you're, you're, you're pinpointing to win, right? We're in a position now to not only win the series, but to sweep the series. So when you got a guy like Joey on the mound who eats up a lot of innings for you, keeps them off balance, I think we're in a good position today to get that sweep. Big bodied, six foot three, 215 pound senior out of Manhattan Beach in California. Rocking the alternate black tops today. The Rebels going with the home white pants. Pacific also going alternate tops. There's our orange with the road grays. Doing the catching this afternoon, Jacob Sharp with Braden Murphy getting the start at first base. Kate Higgins came up lame, sliding into second base on a ball yesterday. So Murphy getting the start today out of an abundance of caution. Gianni Horvat at second. Paul Myro the shortstop. Andy Darian Williams manning the hot corner at third. The outfield left to right, Austin Krizik, Ryland Charles, and Santino Panaro with Alex Pimentel doing the designated batting this afternoon. And leading things off, the right-handed batting center fielder, John Howard Bobo, two of seven to get the year started. It's Tyler Schmidt behind the plate, Alberto Ruiz on the first base side, opposite him at third, Anthony Prater, and big Tim Vesey currently out in right center field, our second base umpire here this afternoon. A picture-perfect day for Sunday baseball here at the Earl as Joey Acosta gets us started on a pitch that swung on, popped up right side, drifting towards foul ground is the first baseman, diving is the right fielder, Panaro, he can't get it as the first pitch of the game fouled off and almost a web gem to get it going by Panaro here on a 12.05 first pitch. Yeah, tough one to get to from all the way out there in right field, right by the bullpen there. Panaro makes a good effort, laying out, just comes up short. There's net. Bermuda Triangle area almost with Murphy who is not as familiar with the first baseman position as he is around the rest of the diamond in the infield. Horvat always gives it a net, an effort and typically that is the outfielder's ball. Credit to Panaro to just make it close. Acosta ahead of Bobo, nothing in one. 
This is inside with a fastball. True four pitch mix for Acosta. Fastball sitting 85 to 88 in the preseason scrimmages. A bit of an uptick from last year, as much like we said a lot of the day yesterday about Sam Simon, the frame filling out a bit for Acosta as he misses away with the breaking ball. Yeah, the frame versus what he's been the last couple of years. He's put on some weight, he's put on some muscle. That four pitch arsenal that you talked about, you know, his best pitch is the breaking ball. So you're going to rely on that almost all day and try to full batters with the, the fastball. Hey, Darian Williams gets a piece of this ripped shot down the third base side. It falls just away from him. He made it a very close play on a well-struck ball by Bobo, who's in safely at first with the base hit to lead off. And that's a situation right there where Acosta is ahead in the count. You don't want to get that one up right down the pipe, and that's what he did. And uh, was ripped to third base. Tried to slip a slider through the front door and Bobo got the hands inside of it. So he's on first, a speed threat to be sure as he takes a big lead. Ben Nemovan in from the left side, falling behind nothing and one on a nicely spotted fastball from Joey Acosta. Last year in his first season in the Scarlet and Gray, a two and three record and a four six ERA. Swingman out of the bullpen started six of his 14 appearances. This is low on a change up to Nemovan. The 266 batter last year, the left-handed batting left fielder, two for nine to start the year this season. Last year in 43 innings, Joey Acosta held opponents to 256 average against on 35 strikeouts to just 10 walks. As his pickoff throw to first is a bit late. Bobo with eight steals last year, none yet in the campaign through two games and the top of the first inning so far in game three. Murphy holding on. Here's the 1-1 one -one from Acosta. Swung on, popped up, shallow to left field. Dropping back is the shortstop, Myro. Coming in is Krizik. He can't find it. It bounces in front of him. The throw to second sneaks past Gianni Horvat. Backing up is Braden Murphy at first base. Krizik lost it in the sun on what will be ruled a base hit, but that one a costly mistake here early with two on and nobody out in the first. Not unlike that first ball that was hit by Bobo into foul territory. This one got up there but hung up so high Krizik was, I think, in position to make it, but he just lost it at the last second in the sun. Yeah, it looked like he was settled underneath, and then at the last moment kind of dipped that to the knees. You knew he didn't have it as it bounced about three feet in front of him. So back-to-back -back base hits on playable balls from the UNLV defense. Have two on with nobody out in the right-handed batting. Chaz Myers squaring a bunt, dropping one down third base side, and touched up by Ian foul territory for strike one. Yeah, you're going to see, I think, the Tigers today play a little small ball. They haven't had a hard time getting hits. They've had a hard time generating runs, right? So then without them being able to get kind of these extra base hits that the Rebels are so accustomed to, I think you might see a little small ball today from the Tigers and Coach uh, Rodriguez. Yeah, coming into the day, the previous two outings, 23 combined hits for the Tigers, but they have left 26 men on through the first two games of the year. Pickoff throw goes to second. Horvat picks it out of the dirt as Bobo is back in standing and safely with two on and nobody out. Pacific has had base runners galore this week, but that's a credit to the UNLV pitching staff so far for limiting the damage when they do so. Yeah, and they've done a good job of controlling that. Haven't turned a lot of double plays. Actually, only one in two games, but uh, been able to get the outs at the right times. Myers whiffs on the bunt attempt, so now with an 0-2 count, likely going to be swinging away. Typically, you see this situation where the most bunts occur. First and second, nobody out in college baseball. At one point, it was an automatic bunt. I mean, the coach didn't even have to give the sign. Nowadays, with the bunt kind of going out of vogue, it's switched up. Myers, meanwhile, switching up his stance, was open, now dead square. He swings and catches this one off the hands, a foul ball straight back. And again, we talked about that first uh, batter with Bobo. Costa being ahead one and two, he's ahead here 0 oh and two. So we got to keep something down and away, looking for the double play, although we do have a big hole between first and second with Horvat shaded over towards the bag. Yeah, Horvat nearly behind second base. Braden Murphy off the bag at first, basically in the back pocket of Ben Nemovan. After a foul ball on nothing and two, here's Acosta's next delivery. Slider just outside. Good 0-2 miss. He started that one in the zone and bent it out away from the right-hander. Yeah, and that's the pitch that we were talking about. I think now you're going to see something a little more inside, try to get him on the on the hands a little bit and turn it from the left side. Acosta's been an 87 to 88, pretty consistent on the fastball here early in his first action of the year. One two pitch, call for strike three, beautifully drifted changeup over the inner third for out number one is Myers, set down looking. Yeah, this is exactly what we're talking about right there. That pitch, pitch sequence was really good right there. Went outside, inside after the two bunt attempts. So Acosta, you know, he, he's, he's a veteran. He's going to know what he needs to do 
painting the plate inside and outside. You don't typically see a lot of right on right changeups over the inner third. Acosta fooling Myers for the first down and now Jeremy Lee leaves the bat over the right shoulder as the catcher swings to the first pitch, chops it down the third base side, but it's foul. Rebels looking for a ground ball double play here off the bat of Lee, who's one of six to start the season, 0 for 3 with a walk and a 8 to 3 Rebel victory yesterday. You know, spending some time with Acosta on the road the last couple of years and in the clubhouse, he's actually really quiet. He's, he, I would actually say he's a little bit shy, but when he gets on the mound, he has a def definitely has a presence. Come set here on 0-1. Breaking ball, nicely spotted. That's the first curveball we've seen. That overhand delivery from Acosta results in a called strike two to Jeremy Lee. And for Acosta, it's not going to be about blowing anyone away with the velocity. It's going to be about how crafty he is with the breaking pitch. He turns and looks to second, nobody covering. This is an opportunity right now. You might see something high in the zone here, maybe a fastball. So when he comes with on nothing and two, look to second. Now they're going to throw that direction. Horvat standing on the bag, but Bobo back in standing and safely. He's been a pest at second base so far. Bouncing around, he's the top speed threat in the lineup for Chris Rodriguez and the Pacific Tigers. Was looking for the clean three-game sweep, trying to get out of the first. The 0-2 hits Lee. He was standing close to the plate as that one gets him on the arm, and that'll low the bases with one out for Peyton Miller. And that's a pitch right there. It's going to absolutely frustrate Stan, uh, Coach Stolte and the pitching staff. 0-2 coming inside with a fastball like that. If you're going to throw that fastball, it's got to be up and out of the zone. You can't take that chance on loading up the bases with an inside pitch. You want to try to get him to offer up at something outside. Instead, it hits Lee, who's on first. Nemevant to second. Bobo to third. Sacks full with one down for Peyton Miller. And this is a tough guy to face with the bases loaded, at least over the course of this opening series. Seven for eight is the second baseman. Costa goes backwards here and throws the breaking pitch first, tumbling through the top of the zone for a called strike one. Miller and eight at bats, seven hits, including a double and four runs scored. He's done the majority of the scoring for Pacific. Wins of eight to three and 14 to six for UNLV so far. Another breaking ball, dropped up the middle. Myro grabs it, touches second himself. A smooth throw to first base is in time to take the run off the board. Joey Acosta and UNLV get out of a bases loaded jam right away in the top of the first. They'll bat for the first time in the home half of the inaugural inning when next. Well, the Hustlin' Rebels able to get out of a jam in the top of the first inning, bringing you back to the bottom of the first here in the third game out of 55 in the 2023 campaign for UNLV. It'll be Ryland Charles, Santino Panaro, and Jacob Sharp, the first three hitters, against the right-hander out of Sacramento, Jake Tandy, making his collegiate debut, at least on the hill. He was a pinch hitter and struck out the other day in uh, the first game of this series and the season. 
And much like many of his teammates, a two-way player, this Pacific team full of them, he'll be up against Ryland Charles to lead things off. A tough start to the year for Ryland, but he's a guy who really never gets too high or low on himself. Charles just one of ten in two games to start the season. Correct, and, you know, this is a tough situation for Tandy coming out on Sunday against a hitting team like the Rebels are. But Ryland Charles, I know he's a little disappointed in the start. He's not going to be held down very long. First pitch is bounced in there, blocked by the catcher Lee, Jacob Weiss at first, Rylan Evans across from him at third, middle infield pairing Peyton Miller and Chaz Myers, as it has been all weekend. In the outfield left to right, very similar for the visiting Tigers, Ben Nemavant, John Howard Bobo, and Tony Otis in right field. Charles swings and misses at the changeup, fooled him in on the hands, and the count goes one and one. Candy's not going to be a guy that's going to overpower you. Freshman coming in, pitching in high school last year, so he's going to have to rely on his breaking ball. Tandy out of Christian Brothers High School in Sacramento. Flips a curveball that Charles rolls fouled on the first base side. Falling behind one ball, two strikes. A very similar looking lineup today for UNLV. With Charles leading off, Panaro and Wright. Sharp batting third and doing the catching. Darian Williams mans the cleanup spot and will play over at third base once again. Meanwhile, the 1-2 to Charles. Swung on and missed. Really jumped out of his shoes swinging at that curveball. As Charles down on strikes for the third time this year, starts the bottom of the first and brings Santino Panaro to the dish with one out, nobody on here in the first. Going back to the last, the uh, top of the inning left there, what a crafty double play that was handled by Myro right there. And you got to give credit to uh, Murphy too for making that stretch. That's a position he hasn't played a lot at, but uh, they made it actually look pretty routine. Yeah, Myro is smooth a fielder as, as you'll see in all of college baseball at the shortstop position. First pitch swinging is Santino Panaro, fights this one off the other way. We've seen that so far this year. We saw it some from Panaro last year, but he swung at the first pitch in nearly all of his nine plate appearances thus far. Yeah, he's pretty aggressive up at the plate this year. Last year he was pretty choosy, so a little bit of a different uh, plate demeanor this year, but uh, I think he's still going to continue to be really solid for us, especially in that second slot. And kind of just going back and forth on the defensive end with him and Pimentel, who was in right field yesterday. He's doing the DHing today, Panaro. And Pimentel basically feature to be the same defender in right field, although they have very different frames. Panaro all of 5'8", Pimentel much bigger. It's a great option for Coach Stolte. This one's fought off the other way. It's fared on the left field side. Panaro makes the turn at first, turns on the Jets and heads to second as the throw from the left fielder Ben Nemevant down the line and a bit late. Santino Panaro with a one-out double on a ball that cleared the head of the third baseman Evans in a hurry. And that's, you know, you hate to say vintage for somebody who's only a sophomore, <laughs> but we've been watching this for a couple years now. That is vintage Panaro right there, just taking a ball that's off the plate, slapping it into the left field, and, uh, you know, not, I don't know if Pacific has much of a book on UNLV, but all they got to do is go back last year and look at the hitting spray chart. They're going to see that like 70% of the time he does go off the field. That's a great example of one thing that uh, Kevin Higgins had talked to us about was keeping the hands inside the baseball. Panaro did a, a great job of that there as that'll bring up Jacob Sharp with the runner in scoring position. And it's like they're adjusting the wristband. The, the Pacific team calling in most of their pitches on a wristband, and it looks like Tandy's going to flip with the third baseman, Rylan Evans. Always interesting to see now in college baseball with so many different options as far as how to call the pitches from the dugout, just how teams decide to do it. UNLV does it with an earpiece. That rule was instituted last year. Finally have some electronic help, but a lot of teams still electing to go old school with the wristband. Oh, old school is no wristband. I guess uh, mid-2000s with the wristband. Correct, and uh, you know he's still getting the signal signaled in from the dugout at le least half the time. Not sure if the catcher does have the earpiece in. Pitch upstairs, called for ball one to Jacob Sharp. Three for six with two walks, and he's been hit by two pitches in his first two appearances for UNLV. And a premier batter out of the catcher's spot, batting third. That was exactly what the coaching staff thought they were going to get, and he's delivered as promised so far. Second baseman Miller keeping an eye on Panaro as this pitch is high, a bit inside, turning sharp away. A breaking pitch that didn't break to bring the count 2-0. And going back to the catcher-pitcher uh, co uh, combination, Coach Vanderhoek, uh, he really likes having the earpiece, but he, for his veteran pitchers, he's more and more letting them call the game. It was different with the continuity of the catcher. Meanwhile, a pickoff throw goes to second, leaping to keep that one from the outfield is Peyton Miller. Able to knock it down and apply the tag all in one swoop as Panaro slid back in safely. You got a veteran in Jeremy Lee who's been at Pacific for four years, playing with a guy who 
the pitcher Tandy at his first collegiate start, first collegiate pitching outing. It's always interesting to see that kind of connection. We were fortunate enough to have the veteran Eric Pajani here for a couple of seasons as his pitch misses high to bring the count 3-0. The, the veteran presence behind the plate makes such a difference at this level. Yeah, and you know, the, the catcher is the extension of the pitching coach that's in the dugout. You may see a few more mound visits from the catcher this year to talk to the freshman. Talk about situations. Talk about you know slowing down or speeding up. So it's going to be interesting to watch what Lee does today. Bobo, the center fielder, shifted towards the left field side as Sharp takes a fastball up and away, a four-pitch walk. Sets up the double play anywhere, but puts runners on first and second with one down for E. Darian Williams. And this is exactly what the coaching staff had hoped by bumping E into the fourth spot in the lineup. More at bats with runners on base and in scoring position in this instance. Yeah, and he's bounced around the, the lineup over the last few years. Settled in at second for a, a long time last year, but this is a chance for him to shine, to your point, getting guys on base in front of him. And your top of the lineup guys, typically those are the table setters, and they did just that with Pinaro and Sharp both reaching after the Ryland Charles strikeout. Right on right matchup here in the first inning as Williams drops the bat on a pitch up by the noggin. Call for ball one, make it five straight balls flipped in there by Jake Tandy. And much like yesterday, the Rebels got into 2-0 and 3-0, 3-1 counts even. It was almost an automatic take. Yeah, and I think you're going to see that today with the youngster on the mound. If you're watching Tandy's delivery here, and he's an over-the-top type of guy, not getting a lot of knee bend right now, so the balls are staying high on him. Williams backs away from that one. A lot easier to take when they're up by the head. You see it out of the hand, and you dip out of the way. Yeah, unfortunately, some of those work back into you at times, so you do have to get your head out of the way. E. Darian Williams, four of his first nine to start the season. He was one of the top hitters on the club last year. 313 average, 11 home runs, second with 67 runs batted in. We're hoping to get even more production out of the bat this year. This pitch way outside. How about Jeremy Lee leaping to keep that one from moving to the backstop? And after a four-pitch walk to Sharp, the count goes 3-0 to E. Darian Williams with Austin Krizik looming on deck. Yeah, Tandy's throw, trying to throw a little too hard right now. He's just got to stay within himself. He actually almost stumbled off the left side of the mound there. It'll be something to keep an eye on as far as the length that they're going to allow Tandy to go. Pacific has emptied the bullpen in each of the previous two games. Williams watches a high fastball call for a strike at the chest for strike one. But wouldn't be surprised to see him take another one. Is that one just a bit up? He's had a quick conversation with our home plate umpire Tyler Schmidt, likely just asking, hey, how close was that one? Yeah, and you, you know, you brought up the bullpen, right? Friday night, Tigers go through five. Yesterday, go through six. You know, how deep is that bullpen when you're actually starting freshman on, Friday, on Sunday afternoon? Fastball bounces in, and that'll be ball four. So. Eight of the last nine pitches for Tandy have been out of the strike, so none of them particularly close. And the base is now loaded with Bonaro to third, Sharp to second, Williams reaching first. And here comes Austin Krizik, power batting, right-handed, hitting, left-handed throwing left fielder. That's a mix you don't see too often. And just a quick glance down the left field line, there is action in the Pacific panel. Right-hander already warming up. Yeah, this is not a, a good situation for the Tigers. You got it. Although the Rebels are a great hitting team, you can't give them free passes because they're going to make you pay for it. Base is loaded, one out in the scoreless bottom of the first. First pitch from Tandy, just below the knees for a ball, and looks like Williams before him would venture to guess that Krizik's going to take a strike. Three for seven with four RBIs and a pair of walks to start the year for Kriz, who's the second leading hitter in terms of batting average last year, batted 342 behind Ryland Charles' team leading 382 mark. Way up and away for ball two. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we're getting a mound visit here before the uh, free pass comes. You know, already a couple of sweatshirted Pacific Tigers running down to the bullpen and left. There's a right-hander warming up. It's Tandy's first collegiate outing as seeing the bases loaded with one out so far. 2-0 to Krizik, slapped the other way, fading down the right field line. That'll drop and roll all the way to the fence for extra bases. One run will score. Here comes Sharp from second base. He'll score as the throw goes down the line. It skips away from the catcher. Williams scores with that a throw. Nobody covering the plate. A bases clearing double for Austin Krizik. Williams going to be scored from the air from third to home. Yeah, great piece of hitting right there. Again, we talked about Panaro going opposite. Krizik's just in the same format and, and, and uh, the approach that he takes. He's going to take a ball to the right side of the field, had a big hook on it. Play was made pretty well by the right fielder. Um, 
right fielder being Otis, what happened was he missed the cutoff man, ball bounces off the catcher's glove, and there was a mad scramble for the Rebels that had just scored and the man on the box trying to get out of the way of that live ball. And here comes that aforementioned mound visit, and they're going to pull Tandy after just one out. So Tandy's first collegiate pitching outing doesn't go as planned. A right-hander coming out of the pen will tell you who it is in the numbers when we return the Rebels on top, three to nothing. So from one Pacific Tiger making his college pitching debut to another, it's the 5'11 freshman Cooper Lands out of Atwater, California. Comes in with Austin Krizik on second. Just one out here in the bottom of the first inning and the Rebels sporting a three to nothing lead. Krizik, a great job of poking one the other way to knock Jake Tandy from the game after just one third of an inning. So far, three runs, two earned, charged at Tandy on two hits, two walks, and the one strikeout against Charles. The only strikeout for Tandy, the only out of the bottom of the first inning so far. And with a new pitcher in, it's a new batter in as well. It's Braden Murphy in from the left side. We'll see what we get out of Cooper Lands. Tandy was really sitting mid-80s with the fastball right down home plate. And the majority of the pitches he threw in the zone because he didn't throw many over a three-batter stretch. Correct, and Lenz is going to have a tough uh, at bat here against the left-handed hitting uh, Murphy. Now, Murphy hasn't uh, seen a lot of pitches yet this year. He had two at-bats yesterday. But uh, Murph, again, we talked about it. His at-bats in the batting cages have been absolutely crushed. So he's going to be looking for something in the zone here if he can find it. But uh, right now, Lance having a hard time finding the zone. Lance buries the second pitch to move it to two balls and no strikes. And yeah, Murphy's one of those guys where you're walking around the cage during BP, and it's just loud. I mean, he's it just sounds different off of his bat than some other guys. Yeah, and it's not the bat. It's, it's the swing. Really true left-handed swing. He generates a ton of top spin as well. Ropes it down into the corner more often than not. See what he offers up on 2-0. and He keeps the bat on the shoulder as it now moves to 3-0. and and Juices flowing for Lands out on the mound in his collegiate debut. And he's missed all three pitches he's thrown so far with Krizik off second and one down. And, you know, the Rebels are talking about this in the dugout. They're talking about another freshman out on the mound right now. But they have to be patient. You're going to be, have some guys that are going to be chomping at the bit as Braden takes a four-count walk, a four-pitch walk. But in the dugout, you got to be talking. Veterans got to be talking to the young guys and saying, hey, listen, I know we want to swing the bat. But right now, you got to take what they're giving us. It's kind of differing schools of thought because they, they both can be right at times. But, yeah, I think that's exactly right here in this instance. Make them come to you because there have not been many pitches in the zone, and there's been a ton of base runners so far. After the Charles strikeout, a double, a pair of walks, another double, and then a walk following. Set up Alex Pimento with a three to nothing lead, two on and one down. And pimento has been a tough out in his first two games with the Scarlet and Gray. Three for four, he's walked thrice. He's been hit by three pitches as well. He's reached nine of his first 10 plate appearances and gets ahead here one and oh. And 
the, the reddest of red lights, I would say, for him in this at bat. Yeah, the, and he's proud in the plate here, too. Lanza's is coming up in, inside, so wouldn't be surprised if we see our fourth hit by pitch for him. Not the way you want to get on base, but I'm sure no. he'll take it here. Again, nine out of his first ten plate appearances have ended with him reaching. So he moves up ahead 2-0 and now as that pitch buried in the dirt from Lance. So Lance is six pitches in now and hasn't gotten anything across the plate. You know, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, the 13 pitches in, pitchers in right now for the, the Tigers. They may have a situation where they're just going to tell Lance, you're going to have to wear this for a while. In a certain series, unfortunately, that's just the way that it is, especially when you use five pitchers on opening day and six pitchers yesterday. No one's gone longer than two innings for Pacific this season. There's a strike from Lance as he clips the inner third, and it's a two-ball, one-strike count to Pimentel, who was playing in right field yesterday. Finished with two hits, hit by two pitches, and a walk. Also drove in three. He has been a real kickstarter for this offense. I think if there's anything close to the zone, you're going to see that you're going to see a wicked swing. He's ready to hack. Steady takes another strike. Lands like an off-speed pitch there. Broke that one in at the knees for a call strike two to Pimentel. Going to shorten up now and put something in play with Chris off second and Braden Murphy big lead off of first with nobody holding him on. Here's the 2-2 as Lance comes set, the delivery. Outside, good job by Lee to keep that one from moving to the backstop. Breaking ball that ended up in the left-hand batter's box, moves the count full. We'll see if the runners go in motion with one out. Yeah, I'm not sure you're going to see that aggressiveness at this point in the ball game, but uh, Coach Higgy's kind of been fooling us a little bit the last couple days. We saw Cade yesterday take off. They both run as the pitch is inside for ball four. Back-to-back so -back walks, one four pitches, won seven pitches, but they end up the same in the scorebook, and that'll load them up. Chris to third, Murphy to second, Pimentel down to first for Paul Myro the fourth, and a real chance to break this game open early. Well, you look at the, the, the field with the Tigers out in the outfield especially, you're seeing a little bit of a bad body language and some posture going on right now. Now, they have been doing their job of getting hits. They just don't have anything on the mound right now, so it's going to be interesting to see what their plate appearances look like because right now they look a little frustrated out in the field. Myro's driven in four runs in his first two games. Two for eight with a couple of walks as well. Takes a called strike to begin the at-bat. And, and with the way that the Rebels have hit here in the bottom of the first, they basically started their at-bats waiting until they get a strike. So now the at-bat really begins for Myro. He swings and rolls one of the first basemen. Picked up by Jacob Weiss. He bobbles it. Does he ever make control? No, he does not as Myro runs into him at first. And caught in a rundown between rundown. second and third. Yeah, that's Murphy. He's to third. Now Murphy running to the plate. This is Murphy between third and home. It's the catcher Lee with it now. No tag applied. Now running him back to second. Murphy takes off of the plate. They get the out at second. And the run scores. There's just one out. They never got the out at first. And during all that, the first baseman Weiss laying down on the first base side. Him and Myra with a nasty collision. Paul's up and standing on the base, but Weiss hasn't moved. Pacific thought that the out was made at first. There was never an out at first base. Weiss never had the ball no, we, on two or three attempts. Yeah, Weiss was bobbling that ball the whole time as he went to finally pick it up. There was a big collision at first. And I think Paul Rodriguez, or rather Chris Rodriguez, has an argument because I didn't ever see a call at first base. No, there was not a call there. It was Alberto Ruiz behind home plate yesterday. Now down the first base side, I didn't see a signal ever. Chris Rodriguez visibly said, was he out or was he safe? He did the hand motions. There was no call. I think he was watching the collision because he looked at back at Myro after he went, you know, kind of butt over uh, tea kettle there and ended up about 10 yards behind first base. Yeah, Myro was fine. I think he got it more in the legs. The, the concern here is the contact made with Weiss and of course, the runner has the right to the base path. There's not going to be any kind of an interference call there. And all four umpires meeting in the infield. Yeah, there was never a call. Myro clearly safe. And What's then the rundown run to perfection, oh, by the way, on the other side. How about that? Well, it did until Lee got all the way to third and then started chasing the runner back to second, which allowed the runner from third to come home. So if Lee just stands there in the base path at third base, he's going to make sure he's got an easy tag. And... You see the third baseman, Rylan Evans, signaling to Lee a kind of a tagging motion. Yeah. He never made the nope. tag at third. Nope. There was never a tag applied at third. I think Pacific thought that there was a handful of separate outs made on that play. Well, by the time this rundown ended, you actually had seven players between second and home because the left fielder and center field both came in 
to work on the pickle. So Weiss up and walking off the field under his own power. That's great to see. Just trying to replay that one in my mind. Believe the put out is going to be one two four because it was lee going back and forth the third baseman was involved so i think it's one two five two four on the put out of alex pimentel at second base who's still standing there by the way yeah they're going to call him safe at third and then he was able to advance home and i'm going to give you a lot of credit for getting all those numbers right kind of replaying it in my mind so two run score pimentel put out at second base again the put out goes one, two, five, two, four for one out at second base. You don't normally see that many players involved in one out. No, and then the, the one thing that's a little baffling too is first baseman, because he was down, nobody's covering home plate. Yeah, and he will be charged with an error on that ball that was hit right to him. So Weiss charged with the error. And now Chris Rodriguez out to take a look and just kind of get the final explanation. So again, Myro safe at first after he reached on an error by the first baseman, Weiss. Weiss lifting out of the game, and it'll be Caden Casagrande coming in as a defensive replacement. We've seen him at a couple of different positions this weekend, and what a situation here to get the bottom of the first going. Yeah, that was, uh, there was a lot going on on that play. You know, the concern too is Weiss at first base. He went down pretty hard. I think he caught a knee to the neck area or to the side of the head. Again, two runs score. It's a five to nothing game with two outs in the bottom of the first inning as Gianni Horvat lifts the first pitch to right. Heading towards the line is Tony Otis and the right fielder drifts over to make the catch. But the Rebels sent all nine batters to the plate in the first inning. They score five runs on just two hits. What a way to start the ball game. The Rebels on top by a handful. What a weird bottom of the first inning. The Rebels sent all nine batters to the plate and played five runs on just two hits with a couple of errors mixed in there as well. And that'll bring Joey Acosta back out for a second inning that looks a lot different than the first. Absolutely. And there was so much going on there. We, it, you know, off air here, we had to figure out what the scoring was on that. It was pretty confusing. He left the runner on base during all that as well. As this one's popped up straight behind the plate by Rylan Evans. Third baseman will watch it bounce into the first row of seats over the screen. Uh, Jacob Weiss, the first baseman, walked off the field under his own power after him and Paul Myro had a nasty collision at first base. He didn't even make an at-bat today as the on-deck batter, Caden Casagrande, came in and as a defensive replacement and awaits on deck with Andrew Guidara, the DH, batting third here in the top of the second inning. Devils looking for the sweep in their 10th win in a row against Pacific. Acosta ahead of Evans, one strike. Line drive right back to him. Acosta does it himself, that bright red glove, snagging that ball out of the air on a lightly lofted line drive. Evans lines out, and we're underway in the top of the second. That was a little softer than it looked originally off the bat. Acosta had plenty of time to get the glove up right just to the left of his ear. Sometimes you see the pitcher react too quickly to that. Acosta read it with the backspin immediately off the bat. And taking care of business himself, here's Caden Casagrande. Again, came in as the defensive replacement for Weiss. He swings at the first pitch, lines one to the gap in right center. That's down and will roll all the way to the fence. What a way to welcome yourself to the game. As Casagrande slams on the brakes at second with a stand-up one-out double here in the second inning. Yeah, nice bit of hitting right there. Went down and got a low breaking ball, drove into the gap, and I believe, if I'm right here, that's, that's the, the second gapper that the Tigers have had 
everything else has just been pretty much hit into the outfield, but nothing hard enough to get through to the fence. Yeah, really, the, the Weiss triple yesterday that was just a slow roller down the left field line was more just because of where he hit it, and Correct. if he hit it harder, that thing gets to the fence in a hurry, and Krizik's able to grab it. Sometimes the slow rollers allow you to get that extra base. So with the runner in scoring position, here's Andrew Guidara making his season debut. Left-handed batting designated hitter this afternoon. Takes a hold ball one inside on the slider. Joey Acosta making his first start of the year and his seventh start since joining UNLV last year. You got to give it to the Tigers. They, uh, they're scrappy. They already have three hits in the first uh, first inning. They're going into the top of the second here. And they've actually out hit the Rebels yesterday. This one's hit in the air to left field. Krizik over into the gap. It takes a bounce in front of the left fielder. And the runner being waved to the plate as Krizik's throw goes straight to second base. The mental error there will allow the run to score and put Pacific on the board. RBI single for Guidara. Yeah, I think there was some hesitation around in third there. If he would have hit cut off early, he might have been able to make a play at the plate. And that was an, an immediate throw by Krizik. He was going to second all the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think if he throws that to a cutoff man on the way to the plate, they have a, at least a shot to make it a bang-bang play. But instead, Guidara drives in the run. It's a 5-1 to one game, and the number 9 man, Tony Otis, squares to bunt, pulls it back on a beautifully executed curveball that tumbles in for a called strike one. And there's some aggressive hitting going on at the plate, too, because those are first pitch swings right there. So they're trying to get after Acosta now. It just makes something happen. The Rebels' bats have been swinging away all weekend. Bouncer right back behind the mound. Shortstop Myro grabs it, touches the second himself, throw to first is in time. Stumbling is Otis after grounding into an inning-ending 6-3 double play. That's how the Rebels have gotten out of each of the first two innings. Due up the top of the lineup to kick it off in the top of the second next. UNLV baseball brought to you by Parkway Tavern, official home of UNLV Athletics and official home of Rebels on the Road. With over 250 beers, 24-7 gaming, and five Valley locations, there's no better place to catch the game than Parkway Tavern. My favorite's the one on Decatur. Along with Dan Dolby, Matt and Everett here from the Earl E. Wilson Stadium on the campus of UNLV. Bottom of the second inning kicks off with the top of the lineup. The Rebels sent one through nine up to bat in a five-run, two-hit first inning. And Ryland Charles, the only batter who did not put a ball in play or walk as he struck out swinging against the starter, Jake Tandy. Here's Cooper Lands facing off against him for his second at bat. Charles takes outside and just some bookkeeping, a final line on the starter, Tandy, third of an inning, four runs charged to him, two of them earned on two hits, two walks and a strikeout. And he is on the hook for the loss if the score holds. Charles in from the left side with a slightly open stance, swings at this pitch and fights his straight back. Count goes one and one. So the Rebels looking for much of the same in the second, although they'll hope to do it without some of the fireworks at first base. Yeah, and you, know, you get Ryland at the plate right here, who's really kind of struggling. Now you can say that through three games because of the way that he's hit the last couple of years. So I think he's going to be a little anxious. He squares to bunt, drops a good one down the third base side. Charging is Evans, third baseman's up and throwing to first. It's not in time. That's one way to bust the slump, an infield bunt base hit. Base hit. The second hit of the year for Ryland Charles kickstarts the home half of the second. You know, if you look down there, he's got a big smile on his face. And he's the type of kid that that will, that will springboard him into more hits coming, more confidence at the plate. But he's done that many times throughout his career at UNLV. Yeah, Ryland Charles, a 382 hitter last year after he batted 306 in his breakout freshman campaign. So he was a real streaky hitter last year, too. He never really had any down streaks, but when he would hit, he would mash. 
Speaking of, here's Santino Panaro, who did a great job last year in his freshman campaign. Takes a first pitch over the inner third for a called strike. Panaro doubled down the left field line back in the first and later came around to score on the RBI double by Austin Krizik. We talked about outfield positioning last inning about with Panaro at the plate. Left fielder has definitely made that adjustment more towards the line. Got to cover a ton of ground in the outfield for Panaro. Chops this one to the left side of the infield. Loved by the shortstop, Myers. The turn by the second baseman, Miller. And his throw to first is late. Fielder's choice. 6-4 on the put out at second base as Panaro replaces Ryland Charles in the base pass. One out, one on for Jacob Sharp. Sharp walked on four pitches in his last plate appearance, so really didn't get anything to hit against Jake Tandy. It's one of the two walks that... The starting pitcher issued, but the patience has been there for Sharp. He's walked three times and has been hit by two pitches in three games so far. You know, Sharpie's going to be, you know, although he's just coming out of the J.C. ranks, he's, he is a veteran, and that's the reason he's gotten the starting nod behind the plate and in the uh, in the lineup here. Premier power spot in the three holes. He takes a fastball just off the outside for a called ball one. He's been two years at Fullerton College at the junior level. A combined 3-1 average in 57 games between the two seasons. Whittier, California native, hit and called a great game, enough to earn the spot on this roster, and he's earned it for sure already. He hammers this one in the air, sky high to left center. Going back is Bobo, center fielder feeling for the wall. He's on the warning track as he makes the catch. Tagging from first, heading to second is Bonaro. He slides in feet first and safely as this one trickles underneath the glove of the first baseman covering. They're doing the job, moving the runner over. Sharp didn't miss that one by much. No, that was uh, a little bit of wind that we usually have here at the Earl going out to center field. That one might have carried, but got deep enough, and Panaro was heady enough to head back to first, knowing that he could tag on that deep fly. And they were ready to double cut. Both middle infielders were out in the outfield, so there was nobody covering second base. It was a foot race between Panaro and the first baseman, Casa Grande. Those are the types of plays that will drive a coach crazy early in the season. It's something you work on a lot in the offseason, but nothing you can really replicate in terms of the game reps like that. Well, yeah, and you've got a bunch of young Tigers out there that are really learning the game at the collegiate level. Williams fouls this one back off the mask of the catcher, Lee. As a professional courtesy, the home plate umpire, Tyler Schmidt, will go hand deliver a ball out to Cooper Land. So call for some more. Just generally give Lee enough time to collect himself. He's taking it one step further. He's going to go get a new new sequence of balls and he's going to just give Lee another minute to stop the alarm bells from ringing in the head but for Darian Williams a walk and a run scored back in the five run first chance with a runner in scoring position here what do you know another opportunity with a runner on second base for Williams through two plate appearances again and that's why he's in that four spot for us making sure that he's got guys in front of him that he can drive in Darian Williams with at least a hit in each of the first two games They're keeping an eye on Panaro at second base the 0 1. Breaking ball well outside. Count goes 2 0 to Williams. He had three hits yesterday, including three singles and an RBI. He's a really streaky hitter as well, similar to Ryland Charles. When they get going, they really get it going. Yeah, once he starts elevating the ball, you're gonna see <laughs> you're gonna see a shift of power. A good hitters count here at 2 0. Now 3 0. Rather 2 1 now as he takes that pitch off the outside. For Darian Williams last year, he had 20 multi hit games in 16 multi-RBI games. He does it in spades. When his first at bat goes well, he usually sets the tone for the rest of the afternoon. Big hole on the right side of the infield as that pitch is up and away, and Williams in another premier hitter's count at three and one with Austin Krizik looming large on deck. If you look at the, the lineup top to bottom for the for, for the Rebels, there's no holes, right? And there's, these are interchangeable too. So if you got somebody that's really kind of moving up from that six and seven spot, there's no reason they can't be in that two and three spot. Williams hits this cap shot off the end of the bat. Nobody covering. First baseman Casa Grand Fields. Pitcher can't get there in time. An infield single for Darian Williams. Moves Panaro to third. Runners in the corners with two down for Austin Krizik. That's another example of a play where the communication's not there early in the season for Pacific. Well, you got two freshmen trying to make that play. Casa Grande at first and Lanz at, on the mound. Lanz was over there in position to make the play, 
but uh, Casa Grande got over there, I think, a little bit too quick. Might have been able to get the play if he would have uh, been a little more patient. Well, and that's one for the pitcher. You draw that imaginary line between the mound and the foul line on the first base side. As soon as that ball gets past that, you know you've got no shot. Your duty at that point is to go cover first base. Well, freshmen, they're not used to the speed at the collegiate level either. Absolutely, yeah. Williams flying down the line. He leads off first with Austin Krizik standing in from the right side. He takes a ball down and outside. krizik has been patient so far this year with a couple of walks, but it was his three RBIs on a double earlier that broke this game open and bounced Jake Tandy from the game. And I believe that's the first 3-0 and count that the Rebels have gone with the green light. Here's the 1-0. Krizik lifts this one way high on the left field side. Third baseman dropping back. Left fielder Nemevan coming in. Neither of them look like they have a beat on it, and it drops in front of the third baseman Evans. Not unlike Krizik's play in the first inning, that ball got way up into the, the light blue sky here with the sunset right behind it. So tough play for the third baseman. Left fielder lost that ball early. He wasn't even close to the ball to make a play. Yeah, Nemovet was trying to shade his eyes with the glove the entirety of that way, but Evans it ended up being a bit closer. Neither of them really was close to it at all on the count. Now goes one and one as Krizik lives to see another one. Gap on the right side of the infield as the first baseman Casagrande holds on. Here's the pitch to Chris. Nicely spotted curveball that fell through the top of the zone for a called strike two. And Chris, like a good two strike hitter, although he doesn't really change the approach that much. You'll see some guys with a drastic difference from their non two strike swing to their two strike stance. Chris, like kind of is in that two strike stance already. He's just yeah, so powerful. He starts short all the time. First pitch or you know, wherever he's at in the count. Behind one and two. The runner breaks for second base. The throw not in time. And scoring with ease from third base is Santino Panaro. That's that play run to perfection. You get the runner started early from first. And the throw from Lee was nowhere close to getting Edarian Williams. It was dropped by Chaz Myers as well. That was six to nothing game. There's a great example of the aggressiveness we've been talking about the last couple of days. Coach Higgy sending that double steal right there. A little bit delayed from third but uh, executed to perfection. It's one where as the catcher, you've got to be sure that you're going to nail that guy at second with two outs. If you're not, you just pump it and let them get that extra 90 feet, look the runner back to third. Instead, the run scores. The next pitch is outside, and all of a sudden, Austin Krizik's got himself a 3-2 count with the runner in scoring position. Generally, you see with runners on first and third, the catcher's going to come out and make some type of defensive signal, right? We didn't see that from the Tigers, so I'm not sure they were prepared. Might be on the wristband. <laughs> Here's the full count offering. Rizek leans away from that fastball up by the chest and works himself a well-earned walk to put two on for Braden Murphy. That's the kind of at-bat that we've come to expect from Austin Krizik. Career 340 plus average. Yeah, and he wants to swing the bat. He will tell you that. And he's not going to be a guy that's going to be out there jumping at the first pitch. He's going to be a guy that's going to be patient. He's going to take what he's given. And he understands his role is to get on base. Well, he did a great job of that last year. As Murphy stands in from the left. You look at the walk totals from each of his first two seasons compared to last year. He had 10 walks in his freshman year, 17 the next year as a full-time starter. And then last year led the team and was almost tops in the country with 46 walks in 58 games. Well, that's not only being selective. That's actually, you know, the the, the, the pitchers have adjusted to him, right? They're, they're afraid of his bat. So he's not getting all of the pitches that he, he was getting early in his career. He also has had a lot more protection in the lineup as he's moved into the middle of it over the last two years. Murphy pops it up to the third baseman. Evans in foul ground, able to glove it just off the side of the third base bag. But the Rebels able to tack on one run on two hits, a couple of runners left on. We've played two full, six to nothing. UNLV leads over Pacific.
UNLV on top, 6-1 to one, as we begin with the top of the third inning. Top of the lineup set to start for the Pacific Tigers. John Howard Bobo, who's single to lead off the game, and digs in for the second time against Joey Acosta. And the Rebels adding on to that picket fence as we talked about yesterday, Dan. Just keep on scoring. Even if it's one run an inning, that makes all the difference in D1 baseball for sure. Yeah, and that's where we're trending the way it was on Friday night, right? Get a crooked number, five kind of not being necessarily super crooked, but a good enough number to get things rolling. And then those picket fences, and then the crooked number comes again. So, yeah, you know, they're, they're a momentum-type team. Is that ball is fouled off over the first base dugout. But right there... You know, we're, we're looking at a Rebel team right now that can score in bunches, right? But last night, we kind of had a couple innings where we, we struggled a little bit. So I, I'm sure Coach Dolte, Coach Higgins, and the rest of the staff is looking for a little more consistency today. They might get it from Joey Acosta. Really, towards the end of last season, he was trending uh, as the biggest innings leader in the rotation. He did a great job of just finding ways to get out as he gets a check swing ground ball from Bobo, fielded by the first baseman Murphy. Great PFP, he's a pitcher fielding practice, as Acosta covers it first. Score that one 3 1 in the scorecard at home as Bobo is retired for the first down of the third. And that's the difference between a veteran ball club right there, right? Last inning we talked about on Williams of his shot at the end of the bat. There was a little mix-up between the pitcher and the first baseman. Right there, Acosta recognized Murphy was going to get to that ball and got straight to the bag. A lot of that's having trust in your teammates, but Acosta, cool as a cucumber, just kind of jogged over there. He knew that he was going to be able to beat the runner. As Ben Nemevant hits a two-hop chopper right at the chest of the second baseman, Gianni Horvat, is flipped to first, is well ahead of the runner, and back-to-back -back weekly tap ground outs get Acosta and the Rebels going defensively in the third. Yeah, and it's all about pitch count right now, right? There's... You know, three pitches in this inning so far, two outs. That's the type of consistency that we're going to be looking at from Acosta to make sure that we're getting those ground balls. He's not going to overpower you. He's not going to have a lot of strikeouts, but he is going to produce a lot of ground balls. He's going to have a lot of strikeouts. The only one he's got today is against the batter digging in now. It's Jazz Myers swings to the first pitch and fouls it down the third baseline. Surprised to see him swinging after two outs on three pitches. Typically, your coaching will tell you, hey, take a pitch. Make him work just a little bit. Coaches hate innings of less than 10 pitches. Yeah, Meyer's not one of the freshmen we've been talking about. He's a veteran, so, you know, that just may be something. He's just trying to be aggressive right now. As this pitch hits him right near the belt line. That one got out of the hand of Acosta, who was dominant at least to start the inning, and that one just a missed pitch. And that's a pitch right there that will drive a pitching coach to drink, where he's got three pitches, two outs, comes inside for a foul, foul, uh, to produce a foul ball, and then throws just a floater that ends up, hit, ends up hitting the left or the right-handed batter right in the butt. So those are the types of things that Acosta is going to have to be better at. And he hit Jeremy Lee, who steps in now back in the first inning on a similar pitch. He was 0-2, missed low and outside, and then the 1-2 pitch hit him on a softly thrown fastball right over the inside. Throw to first is late, back and hit first is Myers. Yeah, and he didn't hit him with fastballs. He hit him with a, a ball that just didn't break. So here's Lee without an official at bat today. Two outs and one on. He stands really close to the plate as he takes that one inside for a called ball one. Well, the previous two innings each ended on six three ground balls in the scorebook up the middle. Can't happen here with two outs. A runner on first base, so they'll take the force out anywhere they can get it. Good lead for Myers. Runner stays. Slider over the inner third for a called strike. Great pitch that started at the front hip of the right-handed batter. Yeah. It, it, Acosta's not afraid to come inside. He just let that last one get away from him. You're going to see him with the batter crowding the plate like that. I think you're going to see a very similar pitch here. Runner fakes a break. It's a breaking ball. It's chopped straight down. So as you predicted, he went right back to the well there. And now Acosta with a little bit of wiggle room. He can kind of throw whatever he wants here. But after those last two, would venture to guess that he might stay away from Lee. Yeah, you know, this is a pitch right here. If you're a fastball guy, you're going to throw it up. If you're a breaking ball guy, you're going to keep this way down in the zone. Sharpie's going to have to be on his toe with a man at first base. Acosta takes the sign and comes set at the belt. Here's his 1-2 out of the stretch. Fastball. Rounder right back up the middle. On his knees, the second baseman Horvat. He'll go the short way. Paul Myro the fourth, the shortstop, covering. So a four-batter third inning so far. So good for Joey Acosta. The bats look to add on when we return. The score, UNLV 6, Pacific 1.
are back in action at the Thomas and Mack Center on February 24th when they take on Air Force. Tip-off is set for 6.30 p.m. Get your tickets by going to unlvtickets.com. UNLV Baseball brought to you by Finley Chevrolet, located at the Southwest at 215 in South Rainbow, Nevada's number one Chevrolet volume dealership. Frankly, we're customer driven. Six to one lead for UNLV over the visiting Tigers of Pacific. The Rebels have already clinched the series with wins in each of the first two games. They'll look for a clean sweep this afternoon. Starting off in a swimmingly good fashion so far, a six to one lead featuring the bottom third of the lineup to up against Cooper Land. It's Alex Pimentel here to lead off the third. Right-handed batting DH moves ahead 1-0 as Cooper Lands, who's going to need to eat some innings, misses low with the fastball. True freshman dealing out of the full line. Pimentel taking up and in. He's walked four times so far in 11 plate appearances and starting out his 12th win as a Rebel. Two-ball, no-strike count. Well, you look at four walks and three hit by pitches. I know he wants to swing the bat. You'd rather hit the ball than have the ball hit you, but his on-base percentage is going to be among the tops in the country after this weekend, no matter what happens the rest of today. Takes his called strike, fastball over the outside, moves the count to two balls and one strike. The former Long Beach State dirtbag Alex Pimentel was a really good get for this coaching staff. He was a name that was brought up almost immediately when we talked to them in the preseason. Yeah, and you talk about the on-base percentage with that walk in the first inning. He's up over 900 now. Crazy. Takes this fastball low, and the count moves to three and one, so he's either geared up on something in the zone or looking to take his fifth walk of the year already. Get some encouragement from the third base coach, Kevin Higgins, right here. I know he wants to swing the bat, but I think he's mature enough that he'll take what he can get. Takes that one down and inside, and as you predicted, the walk and the count, or the fifth walk of the season for Pimentel sets up Paul Myra with a runner on. Chaz Myers, the shortstop, lifted from the game. Jack Mecho out of Fairfield, California, now in at shortstop. Mecho takes over for Myers. You wonder how much of that had to do with the swing on the first pitch of that at bat after three pitches, two outs. We've seen coaches pull guys, and it, uh, that's about as much of a veteran as they have on the roster in Myers. Yeah. It could happen to him. It could happen to anybody. Yeah, you know, Coach Rodriguez may be making a point right there. We talked about that. He should know that as a veteran on this ball club. So Mecho wearing number 40, M-E-T-C-H-O, replacing Chaz Myers. Mecho. Another freshman. Another freshman. Won't make that bat until likely the fifth inning as Myers was hit by the pitch and ended the inning and put out up the middle on the fielder's choice. Paul Myers with a fourth takes outside. Two balls and no strikes account to the Rebel shortstop. Reached on an error and it kicked off that bombastic play in the first that allowed three runs to score and knocked the starting first baseman Jacob Weiss out of the game. Pimentel with a good size lead off of first. Plenty of room on that side of the infield. Myro swings. He goes the other way but pulls it foul just between the wickets of Kevin Higgins down the third base side. And swinging on 2-0. He liked the offering that he got down and in by the kneecaps. That was a similar looking pitch to the one that he homered on in the opening day game on Friday. Yeah, and if you look at, uh, you mentioned the fact that Pimentel had a pretty good lead for a big man right there. We know he does have some wheels, but Lanz is not doing anything to keep him tight. We've seen Joey Acosta keep an eye on the Pacific base runners that have reached all day. Really haven't seen the same from the other side. As Pimentel breaks, it was maybe a bit late, but he slides in feet first and safely under the tag applied by the new shortstop. Yeah, and that, that base was stolen by Pimentel off the pitcher, lands right there. First of all, he's not even checking the runner. He gives a little quick look early in his setup, but did nothing to get him back to the bag. 
big lead like that, you're going to take that any time you can. It was a big lead, but a late break. He really didn't go until that pitch was already on the way to the plate in there ahead of the throw from Lee. We've already seen the Rebels run more on the pass this year than on the last year. As Pyro hits this ground ball through the left side of the infield. Stop sign held up at third. That's as far as Pimentel will advance. That ball cut off by the third baseman, Evans. So a walk followed by a stolen base and a base hit. Have runners on the corners. Still nobody out for Gianni Horvat in a 6-1 to one ball game. Great piece of hitting right there by Myra, which we're going to come to expect year and a day in and day out from him. But right there, he just took a ball that a little low down in the zone, kind of on the hands and drove between the gap. Pimentel holds up at third with no outs. So runners on the corners right here with, with Horvat, who's shown a little pop the last couple days. Yeah, ripped a ball over the head of the center fielder yesterday that cleared his head in a hurry. 97 miles an hour off the bat. Gianni waves the bat in front of the chest from the right side as he takes a first pitch breaking ball away from Lance. In this situation where Lance needs to get after Horvat, you've got to be aggressive with the left-handed hitting. Rylan Charles coming up. Uh, he's on deck right now. You don't want to see him bases juice with no outs. And set on 1-0. Here's his offering. Horvat started to go around. Holds up and smartly so as that fastball is low and Couple more bodies jogging down to the left field bullpen for Pacific. So we may see another pitcher warming up. Notice number 28, Tyler Stout running down there. And with the catcher joining him, it looks like Stout may get it going here shortly. 2-0 to Horvat. Runner goes from first. Horvat rips a line drive into the left field corner. That one's going to roll all the way to the fence. Both runs will score as Horvat rounds second and stops after a two RBI double. Horvat starting to get that line drive swing going. We've seen it all weekend, and he cracks this one open on a two RBI, two bagger. It's now an eight to one lead. Yeah, and Myra was actually breaking from first base on the steal, so he was easily able to come around. That's the aggressiveness. You don't see a catcher stealing this often, running as aggressively as, as, as catchers usually are, but he's done a good job of making sure that he stayed within what he could do, but and Horvat right there, taking that ball inside and just ripping it down the third base line. You know, Giovanni is going to be a big factor for us this year. He's got a good size lead off second. That ball, meanwhile, 102 off the bat. That's his hardest hit ball in two seasons with UNLV as Charles swings and misses at strike one. 102 off the bat. I mean, for a guy of his stature, he's, he's not a big guy at 5'11", 165 pounds soaking wet, but he's really starting to sting the ball as Charles yeah. fouls it off. And we, we talked about it yesterday on the broadcast. It's all about technique, right? Last year, you know, his hands got away from him at times. He was trying to do things that he doesn't really can do or is comfortable doing. This year, I think he just looks a little more comfortable at the plate, and it showed over the last couple of days. Charles behind nothing in two, lands. Looking for the first out here in the third inning. Bounces this pitch in the dirt. Horvat thought about advancing, but stuffing by the catcher. Lee keeps it from going to the backstop. Get the runner from moving up to third base. Every time I see Rylan come to the plate and sitting behind it like this, I think of George Brett. He's got the same stance, bat sitting on his shoulder, but then gets into that cock cock position when the ball comes out of the hand. He chops one. Right side of the infield, charging in the second baseman Miller. Gloves and transfers all in one motion. The throw to first is in time. A nice play, although Horvat moves from second to third. Charles grounds out 4-3 for out number one here in the third. And with another runner 90 feet away, it's Santino Panaro doing, who's reached twice, once on a double and on a fielder's choice in the second. Panaro batting in a, a new spot in the lineup this year, bumped way up. And he figures to hit second the majority of the season. I think on a lot of other teams, he would be even higher. There's only one, one other spot to go to. True. And this is a situation right here with the first baseman way deep. You may see him put one down. He'll Takes. bunt for a hit consistently. We saw Charles do that in his last time up. Uh, Panaro takes this one in for a called strike one. Panaro, an outstanding debut, to put it lightly, in his freshman year last year. At 346. One of the top on the team. He puts this one in play to the right side. Charging is the second baseman. Miller, similar looking play, and he makes it. But with the run scoring, it's an RBI on a ground out for Santino Panaro. So with Horvat on second, Charles and Panaro both chop one to the second baseman. He moves up 90 feet on each, and Horvat scores. And the Rebels lead extended now to 7-1. to one. Yeah, and that's a situation right there where Panaro just did a good job getting it to the right side of the infield. We've got speed on the base path at third. He's going to score easily. He did his job to get the RBI. I beg your pardon, a 9-1 lead. 
of the Rebels as they continue to add on. Five in the first, one in the second, now three in the third. Base is empty, two down for Jacob Sharp. Sharp 0 for 1 with a walk and a fly out to straightaway center field in his last time up. So he takes that breaking ball high and a bit outside as well. That is Tyler Stout down there warming up for Pacific, so Land's pitches are numbered here. Looking out of the full wind with no base runners on, he'll step off and make sure that himself and the catcher Lee are on the same page. Outfield playing sharp to pull, infield shaded deep. Takes away another breaking ball from Lands. Two balls and no strikes now. You know, we talked about the lack of experience for on the mound for the Tigers the last couple of days. This is, though, getting these innings early in for the Tigers with all these youngsters is going to set that up, them up for conference play. And that's what it's all about. It's about getting experience as that ball's looked at low and away. But the experience that these guys are getting right now, later in the year this year and later in their career, are going to be... Totally beneficial to them. 3 0 count to Jacob Sharp with the Darian Williams watching from the on deck circle. 3 0 pitch right down Broadway for a called strike one. So now Sharp with plenty of options and plenty of room to right field. Right fielder Otis continuing to move away from the line. Sharp hasn't gone the opposite way yet in the small sample size, but he does have three hits in each of the first two games. Pass ball away for ball four and Sharp. On via the base on balls for his second time in three plate appearances today. You know, in the, you know the challenge for the Tigers is you got to pick your poison, right? You're going to walk sharp there on four pitches. Now you got to face the hot hitting Darian Williams, and after that you got Austin Krizik. So there, you can't pitch around anybody. That was one thing that the coaching staff really stressed to us early is even though they lost some big bats, they gained a more balanced lineup because of it. That it extends to the base paths as well. They've been running already. Williams hammers this one to right center field. Charging it is the center fielder Bobo. It bounces between him and the right fielder as Williams advances the runner two bases sharp into third. E with his second hit in his many at bats. He's two for two with the walk and a stolen base today. And that extends the inning for Austin Krizik. Good recognition there too by Sharp. He realized that that ball was going to get down, never slowed down. Easily got into third base, so now runners on the corners with two outs and Austin Krizik. So here's Kriz, right-handed batting left fielder who's doubled home with a trio of runs and walked in his two plate appearances today. To extend the damage in a 9-1 to game. Williams off first, Sharp off third with two outs. First pitch, breaking ball, called for a strike just off the outside. There's a nodding in agreement. He was going to take that one regardless. You talked about the coaching staff telling us about a more rounded batting order, right? You know, that's a pretty bold statement when you hit 326 as a team last year. Grizzik rolls this one up the middle. That'll score sharp from third as Williams stops at second. The Rebels into double digits for the second time this season. On top now, 10 to 1 in the third inning. RBI number four on the day. Number eight on the year already for Austin Krizik. Eight RBIs through two games and three innings and absolutely blazing hot start for the outfielder. Yeah, Mitchell was shaded way over towards third base, left a big gap between him and the bag. And the Krizik just found the hole right there. With Murphy coming up, I know Murph right now, he's looking for his first hit. Let's see what type of uh, approach he takes, not to be too aggressive. Takes the first pitch, so that, that approach there, you always want him to have a plan up there. Murphy made the final out of the second on a pop fly out to the third baseman, Rylan Evans, in foul territory, and now is the ninth batter of the third inning. Rebels had sent all nine to the plate in the first, and now get batted around. Inside for a ball. Of course, there's the age-old debate of is batting around sending all nine, or is it when the lineup wraps back around? I, I'm more subscribed to the latter. That, that's kind of how I always thought about it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. But that is a, that's a debate. That's one of those ones, like, is a hot dog a sandwich that you think there shouldn't be a debate, but there's always just that, you know, kind of argument and discourse going on in the baseball world. If he checks the swing, they appeal down the third base side. Yes, he did, says Anthony Prater. And the count goes two and one. The one that kills me, and you see it on social media, will say, is water wet? Obviously, <laughs> but people make the arguments that it's not. It's, it's crazy. Hot dog's not a sandwich. Water is wet, and batting around is when you send 10 up to the plate in the same inning. Now that we got that established, here's the 2-1 to Murphy. 
Flying right back our way, and the count goes even at two. I know back in the day when I had hair and I took a shower, my hair was wet. So water is definitely wet. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. People will convince themselves of anything nowadays. But it's a 2-2 count to Murphy, who walked and then popped out, as we talked about. When he really puts a charge into one, he's a gap-to-gap -gap hitter. He hasn't gotten as many opportunities as some of the other players who have been sweet swinging over the last two years. Murphy hammers this one to right, charging his own as it bounces in front of him and sneaks over his head. Williams scores. Krizik's on his horse. He's getting the wave to the dish. The throw from the right fielder, Otis, misses the cutoff man, so Krizik scores easily. That's a two-RBI double for Braden Murphy, and the Rebels have now batted around in the third inning, and they're on top 12-1. to one. Hey, Great to see Murph there get his first hit of the season. I know that sometimes that's a big burden. You kind of challenge yourself to make sure that uh, that doesn't go on for too long. But uh, Otis did make a, an error in right field, letting that ball bounce over his head. Um, and, and again, Otis being a freshman out there in right field, you know, it, it, these guys are getting experience, but they are making mistakes that they shouldn't be making at this level. So a base hit E9 brings both runners home, and that'll bounce Cooper Lands from the game as Tyler Stout jogs in. Give you his numbers so far, and we'll be back in a moment after the pitching change with the Rebels on top, 12 to 1. Senior right-hander Tyler Stout takes over here with two outs in the home half of the third, and the Rebels dominating over the Pacific Tigers 12 to 1. Alex Pimentel led the inning off with a walk. He stole second and scored on a Gianni Horvat double. He'll make his third at bat of the day, second of the inning. With a runner on second base, it was Austin Krizik. Single error by the right fielder Otis brought home the second of two runs that scored on the play, and Stout gets ahead of Pimentel, nothing in one. Stout out of Turlock, California. Reached a couple different junior colleges, including Modesto Junior College. He's in his second year with the Pacific Tigers, so one of the lone veterans on this pitching staff out of the pen. This ground ball off the glove of the first baseman into shallow right field. The runner is going to round third, heading to the plate, and scoring with ease is Braden Murphy. That's a costly error by Caden Casagrande on a play that likely could have been made if he had fallen a little bit further to the left. So Pimentel reaches on the error. Scoring from second is Murphy, a 13-1 lead for UNLV, piling it on here in the third. Yeah, that ball was hit sharp off the right-handed right, right -handed hit and batter, so it had a little curve to it, working back towards the bag, but Casagrande didn't move his feet enough to get back over towards the, the bag to make that play. So now Myra with his second at bat of the inning. Well, Myra the fourth singled and scored earlier in this frame. And again, another base running opportunity for Pimentel. And up, up, up 12. We'll see how the, the aggression is, but he absolutely is going to take an extra base if given the opportunity as Myro falls behind nothing and one on a called strike. You know, at bottom of the third here, you're probably going to see Coach Higgins holding some, some guys up, not to be too aggressive, not to rub this in too much with the Tigers. It's a, a respect thing at that point, especially early in the year. Yeah. Pitch high to Myro to even the count. 
you know, we look at the Tigers right now. They're, they're on their 14th pitcher of this three-game home series for the Rebels. Looking ahead at their schedule, they do not have a midweek game. So they are going to get some rest before they play University of Milwaukee three games at home next weekend. Slider in the dirt. Barry DeMiro for ball two. And, yeah, that gives not only the players a chance to rest, but a, the coaching staff an opportunity to kind of assess what went down, see what went well, what went badly, and kind of make the adjustments from there. Really going to need to have some guys stretch out. They didn't have anybody go longer than two innings in each of the first two games. Well, the technology, we talked about that with the catcher getting the signals from the dugout right in his earpiece. But the technology in the clubhouse, too, is, you know, baseball back in the day, they didn't watch much, much film. They have everything broken down now through DSV or any of the stat track uh, systems that the teams have. They'll be able to go back and evaluate some of this stuff and hopefully make some positive adjustments. Here's Stout's three and one pitch. That's up and in by the jawline of Paul Myro. So he reaches for the third time today. He's done it in three different fashions. An error, a base hit, and a walk. And that extends the third inning. Now the 12th batter of the frame is Gianni Horvat. And we talked about uh, last inning, we talked about the picket fences and talked about those crooked numbers. Seven's definitely a crooked number. So I think what we're going to start seeing, when we, I think we'll start to see some of the youngsters or some of the guys that haven't gotten in the lineup yet from the Rebels at least get in the latter innings. Horvat goes the other way, a line drive through the right side of the infield. Rounding third and heading to the plate as Pimentel. This one's cut off by Casa Grande, and Pimentel scores standing up without a throw. Myro sliding head first and safely into third. It's an RBI base hit for Gianni Horvat. It's his third ribby of the day, and the Rebels continue to pour it on, now leading 14-1. to 13th batter of the inning will be Ryland Charles making his fourth plate appearance in less than three innings. Yeah, and watching Horvat take that at bat, he, again, he's just taking what he, he's been given, low and away. He's going to push that over towards first base. 102 off the bat again, though, for him. So he's not hitting soft liners. He's hitting balls that are really hard. That's twice in his last two at bats. He's had an exit velo of 102 miles an hour. If we're not a big guy, that really takes a lot to generate that whip as Charles takes a called strike one from Tyler Stout. It was pretty interesting watching at third base. It almost looked like Coach Higgins was going to hold Panaro up. He thought about he, it. He kind of gave him just kind of a really half, you know, okay, let's go. Still got to play baseball, right? I guess we got to send you. As Tyler Stout just trying to get out of Dodge here in the third inning, limit the damage. Rebels have scored eight so far in the frame. They've scored at least a run in every inning thus far. Charles fouls it back. Count goes a ball and two strikes. The final line on Cooper Lance, by the way, you can... Close it up, eight runs, six earned on seven hits and five walks over two and a third inning. Of course, the negative is obvious, but the positive is the longest outing by a Pacific Tiger this weekend. This one way outside. Stout tried to drift a change up in there. Stout, meanwhile, last year in his first season at Pacific, 17 outings, including a start, two and two with a 13.06 ERA. 22, 20 and two thirds innings, and 30 earned runs. Struck out 12 batters and walked 16. Stealing out of the stretch, Charles rips a line drive through the right side of the infield. That'll score another run as Myro touches it up. Horvat safely at second. 15 to 1 the lead for UNLV with two outs in the third. Again, Charles just goes down low. He starts with a, a with a bend in his knees, bend in his back, all out of George Brett. But he goes down and gets that pitch. He gets down to a level where it's even with his hips able to get his hands through and hips through, and that's why he rips those balls into the, the gaps many, many times. And he's similar to Austin Krizik, where he doesn't have that two-strike approach. He's kind of always in that two-strike approach. Charles, that may be even a shorter swing than Krizik, which is saying something for sure. Another guy with a tight swing is Santino Panaro. He swings to the first pitch. Ground ball back up the middle. Higgins sends the runner from third, stops him at second. You could tell there was some internal dialogue there as Horvat scores to make it a 16-1 game on an RBI single from Santino Panaro. Yeah, Gianni, I know he wanted to go all the way, but he <laughs> did pick up the signal late there, and uh, Coach Higgins does send him. You know, we talk about Coach Higgins. We, we know the story on Coach Stolte, but we actually have a new addition to the coaching staff this year, Justin Jones, over at first base. Uh, one of the Rebel greats actually was on the last team that went to a regional for the Rebels back in 2014. Spent the last couple of years coaching high school baseball over at Powerhouse 
Bishop Gorman, but I know the coaching staff is really excited about what Justin brings to the staff. It brings a lot to the infielders as well. There's a lot you know, working with them, and just dealing from that experience is a huge positive, especially for someone in the on-field staff, someone that has such an impact in the day-to-day -day operation. Well, you go back to when he played, and I, I vividly remember him playing not unlike Rylan Charles, as that ball's hit through the gap, another single, Charles does come around to score, and that's gonna make the score 17 to one. But Justin has the same approach and played the same way that Rylan Charles does. So I know that he's you know, a younger coach, so the players really, really relate to him. Where you've got Coach Higgins, who's a veteran, been around for a long time, Coach Stolte, you know, he, he, he's been around in the game for 40 years. You got Justin, he brings that kind of player mentality as a, as a coach. And college baseball, it's one of the unique atmospheres where having a younger coach is definitely an advantage. Some, some other sports it may not be, but in college baseball, it absolutely is. It gives you someone to relate to on, a, on an eye-to-eye -eye level. Here's a Darian Williams who swings to the first pitch, hits one high in the air to right center field, fading away from Bobo. The right fielder Otis comes in and makes the catch to end the bottom of the third inning. And that's a big one. You talk about the picket fence. They did the double picket fence. 11 runs in the third. And the Rebels with a 17-1 lead after three innings full. UNLV baseball is back. No matter where you're watching this baseball season, be sure to buy a cold, crisp Dos Equis and say go Rebels. Back with the top of the fourth. If you're just tuning in, you didn't miss much. Just 11 runs in the bottom of the third on 16 batters. And the Rebels dominating Pacific 17-1 to going for a clean three-game sweep. Joey Acosta misses inside his 35th pitch of the afternoon. He's thrown 28 of them in the zone. He has been lighting up that strike zone. Yeah, but we're also heading into a point in the game where coaches are going to have to make a decision, right? This this game is all but over at this point. Do you want Acosta to eat up some innings so that you're saving the bullpen for the next you know, five games? Or do you want to pull him and quite possibly he could be fresher on his next, next start, which is going to be down in San Diego. Get some young players in. Acosta flips a curveball, missing just low to Peyton Miller, the right-handed batting second baseman, number five hitter in the lineup for Pacific, leading things off. A couple of defensive changes, speaking of players getting some playing time. It's Chase Dittmar in at third base, the basic high school product over at the hot corner. As he watches Miller swing and foul it straight back to the screen to go two and two. And out in left field, Jay Sharman takes over for Austin Krizik. Sharman will lead off when the Rebels are due up in the bottom of the fourth inning. Other than that, everybody else the same defensively. And it is likely not the last of the defensive substitutions for Stan Stolte and company. No, and I think Dittmar is a guy that the coaching staff is really high on. A true freshman coming out of basic high school, played on a state championship uh, team there at the highest level. He's a kid that's got good size, he's got a good bat, been battling through some injuries though, first first part of the year here. Didmar profiles as a true third baseman. 
He's got a defensive chance here on a chop ball. Fields it cleanly, throws it cleanly. It's up the line, but in time. Welcome to the game, Chase Dittmar. A stellar grab and throw from third base for the first out of the fourth inning. Yeah, great job coming in. Threw across his body. We've got to give some credit to Braden Murphy yeah, right there. Definitely. Ball is up the line, but he was able to tap his foot back and find the bag. Dittmar listed at 6'1", 200. You come into college with a frame like that, they're going to turn you into a slugger for sure. Here's the third baseman, Rylan Evans. Swings to the first pitch. Sneaks it, but just foul. Thought for a moment that our third base umpire, Anthony Prater, was going to call that a fair ball, but he was straddling the line, and it was to his right, an easy call for strike one. Joey Acosta with as much run support as you could ask for as a pitcher. He's been the benefactor for sure of some great batsmanship and four defensive miscues for Pacific already today. One run, four hits, four errors. A unique line score for the visitors. Sliders outside for ball one. Count goes even to Evans. And this is also a situation, though, being on the mound with this big of a lead, you, you can't get lackadaisical. You've got to stay within yourself. Go with the game plan that the, coach, the pitching coach came up with you for at the beginning of the game and, and make sure that you're executing because right now what he's doing is he, he's given himself a chance to work on other things, whether it's a breaking ball, with a slider. You know, this is good practice for Joey. Can't replicate game reps, says Acosta misses way outside there. Rolls to the backstop to even it at two and two. And yeah, you know, I like that you mentioned that because, you know, when you're early in the game, you're just trying to get out. So you do it however you can. But in this instance, you kind of have the leeway to work on whatever you want out there. Yeah, you can't replicate this in the cages. Swing and a line drive ripped foul. Pulled down the third base side by Evans. And the count remains two and two. Evans hit that soft line drive right back to Acosta back in the second inning. It was the first out of the inning. It was followed up by a double off the bat of Caden Casagrande, who came in as a defensive replacement for Weiss. So after that one's retrieved from the left field corner, no action in the Pacific bullpen. It's been a quiet today by, by comparison. Five pitchers Friday, six yesterday, three today so far. This one's lined in the shallow left center field. That's going to drop in front of Jason Sharman for a base hit. The first of the day for Evans and his sixth of the weekend. They can't take it away from Pacific. They are scrappy, and they put the ball in play, to be sure. Yeah, that ball was not hit very hard, but it's the old adage, hit it where they ain't. So, and, and he's been doing that consistently for the last three days. Finding ways on, and the, the main contributors offensively for Pacific have been two freshmen. Peyton Miller, who led off the inning with the ground ball out, and Rylan Evans, who singled there. Pretty, pretty impressive by a bunch of young guys. Got something there with those two. Right-handed batting, Caden Casagrande takes a called strike one on a beautiful breaking ball listed in there by Joey Acosta. Runner on and one out, trying to get a ground ball double play to get out of dodge in the fourth. This one's tipped straight back, and the count quickly nothing and two to Casagrande, who doubled on the first pitch he saw after entering into the game. Lined it to the gap in right center field and was eventually plated just two pitches later on an Andrew Gadara base hit. Those are two really good curveballs right there. Started mid-box, got back across the plate for both of them. We'll, we'll try to get some information on what the drop is on that. Big swing and a miss. Here's the count. Out of that strike three, that was the 0-2 yep. pitch by Acosta. I was judging by the reaction there. Really nobody reacted. Just kind of a slow swing and a Slow walk back to the dugout for Caden Casagrande. Nobody else moves. So that is strike three, just the second punch out of the game. The first swinging for Joey Acosta. It is an all-important second out here in the fourth. And there's Andrew Guidara working his way around to the left-hand batter's box. And Joey's about on his pace for his average to get three to four strikeouts per game. So getting one looking early, getting the swinging uh, strikeout there. Joey's, Joey's showing some maturity up there. I really like the fact that He's staying within himself. He's working at a good pace. I think the communication is really good between him and Sharpie. Right now, they got a good battery uh, mate going on right there with Sharpie. And his breaking ball is really moving. Yeah, he's had it working today and gets ahead quickly. Nothing in two on Guidara, who, as mentioned earlier, singled home the run in the second. To this point, the only run for Pacific today. It's been a focal point for the Rebels all weekend is saving that bullpen for the midweek and down 16 runs Evans takes off and will give, give him credit for a stolen base. I think it's worth noting that if this was a conference game 
there is a run rule now in the Mountain West Conference. After seven, up by nine or more, that the game will be called. Non-conference games, what has to happen is at the plate appearance with the umps, with the coaches at the beginning of the game, they can agree on making sure that uh, the run rules is enforced. We don't know this from up here at this point. Acosta gets a called strike three, back-to-back -back Ks, and he sets down the side in four batteries in the fourth. Rebels do up, leading 17-1. to one. Jay Sharman to lead things off in the home half of the fourth inning. Dan Dolby along with Matt Neverett here at Early Wilson Stadium. Sharman not wasting any time swings to the first pitch. Corkscrews one into left, but it hangs up there as Ben Nemevant takes away a base hit from Jay Sharman. Now you like the aggressive mentality there for a guy who's already making his second plate appearance of the year. Yeah, and Sharman put a good swing on the ball right there, kind of inside out to take the opposite field. Ball hung up a little bit more and uh, Nemovant was able to come in under that and make the play. So with one out on one pitch, Braden Murphy, expect him to take one. As Tyler Stout works in his second inning out of the pen and buries one down low. With keeping an eye out, looking through the binoculars at this Pacific defensive setup, and they've got the same eight out there. Same nine is the last inning with Stout returning on the hill. And he gets a chest high fastball in for a called strike to even the count against Braden Murphy, who's walked, singled, and driven in a run. He and that single in the bottom half of the third that not only bounced Cooper Lance from the game, but extended this one. This is going to be at least a single as he hits it into left center field. Murphy on his horse. He's heading for two. The throw from the center fielder, Bobo, goes through the cutoff. Man, it's not in time. A hustle double for Brain and Murphy. It's his second hit of the game, and the Rebels continue to mash at the plate. Absolutely. And Braden right there took that ball opposite field on a pitch that was low and outside, but he was going. Once he made his his, uh, his contact out to the outfield to see where the ball was, he was moving around first base. Not sure that's what Coach Higgins wants at this point in the game, but I love the aggressiveness. He turned that into a hustle double, and for Braden Murphy, he's playing for playing time. It's one of those things where you, you that's what you're thinking about, but you got to be on the same page as the coaching staff. As Pimentel goes the other way, a roller into the corner. They've got no choice but to send Murphy from second base. <laughs> into second is Pimentel. He will yeah, stop, there stop there with an RBI two bagger. So Pimentel replaces Murphy back to back doubles, and the lead now 18 to 1. Yeah, <laughs> first pitch swing right there from Pimentel. Takes the ball down the right field line. Um, and Braden was moving. There's no, he, like to your point, he had to come home on that pitch right there. And, and an, an, another base on for Pimentel. So he's been on four times today. Maybe it's five. No, four, yeah. Four times today. So his on base percentage is through the roof. We're looking at a probably about 940 right now, 935, 940. Whatever 13 out of 14 is. Yeah, I'm not a math guy. Yeah, that's, that, that's why we do this. <laughs> As this one's pulled through the left side of the infield, held up at third is Pimentel on a base hit by Paul Myro. And the hit parade continues here in the fourth. 11 runs on nine hits in the third. They sent 16 batters to the dish, and that momentum doesn't look like it snapped whatsoever here in the fourth. Yeah, and you almost feel bad for uh, Stout at this point. You know, he's going to have to wear this, unfortunately, because there's that, the, the Tigers' bullpen is pretty much done and, and over with. 
little break in the play right here, trying to get some information from the Tiger dugout. But right now, well, you know, you know, Stout's going to have to wear it. Yeah, and he, he's going to have to do it against a pinch hitter here as Noah Rodriguez makes his first college at bat. Rodriguez takes a called strike. That's what the discussion was. So Gianni Horvat lifted after going two for three with a single, a double, three RBIs, and two runs scored. Pretty good day at the yard. Oh, yeah, he did it in three innings. So here's Noah Rodriguez, another California product on the Southern Nevada team, as he swings and hits one on the left side. Grabbed by the third baseman Evans. Nice feed to the back at second. And a beautiful turn and throw from the second baseman Miller in time to first. Rebels able to tack on a run on three hits, but an inning-ending double play by Noah Rodriguez stops the damage at 18-1 to one after four innings full. Joey Acosta back out for the top of the fifth inning. Noah Rodriguez remains in the game at second base. First pitch swinging is Tony Otis. Skies one to left field. Going back is Sharman. On the move, the left fielder makes the catch in front of the warning track. So Jay Sharman flied out to left on the first pitch of the bottom of the fourth, and Tony Otis returns the favor by screaming out to him in the bottom, making the top of the fifth. That's one of the harder balls that the Tigers have hit this weekend. Otis just missed getting that one into the gap at the 375 mark, but Sharman was on his horse and was able to get over there pretty easily. A lot of that comes down to the first step. You can tell whether a guy's going to be able to get there on that first step or not, and Sharman, great job defensively to track it down. John Howard Bobo squares to bunt, pulls it back, and takes a called strike. That's just to kind of change up the look. He had no thoughts of bunting there, down 18-1 to one here in the fifth inning. Joey Acosta just trying to keep the status quo as Bobo fouls one off the front foot. Got the left ankle protected, but doesn't have that flap that goes over the, the top of the shoe, and that looks like exactly where he fouled it off. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, they, they wear those flaps. The, the front of the shoes are protected a little bit off the toe, but on the top of the foot there, mm. that, that's painful. Yeah, right where the, the shoelaces cross over, not only is that probably the, the thinnest part of any baseball cleat, that's the, the boniest part of your foot. And yeah, we'll see, you know, guys foul it off and, and break a foot, chip an ankle. And with Bobo back in, he was never in question as a couple of more bodies, meanwhile, heading down to the Pacific bullpen. We'll keep an eye on that for you. As Acosta is ahead, they're even at one. Bobo backs out of the way of this fastball. The center fielder, one for two so far, led the game off all the way back in the first inning with the single, and grounded out three to one. Murphy to Acosta back in the third. Bobo takes in, and the count goes three and one. Just taking a look at the scorecard, the Rebels faced off against five Pacific Tigers in the first, and then four in each inning since. Acosta has done an outstanding job of not letting any one particular frame get away from him. Bobo screams this one foul, count goes full. Yeah, he's done a good job of managing his pitch count, but I think, and, and a lot of that's set up too by the mix of his pitching, right? He's really kept the Tiger batters on their heels. There have been a couple guys that made some pretty good contact but he's done a good job of mixing up his pitch, pitch, pitches. 3-2 pitch, misses high. It's his first walk of the game. It comes to Bobo here in the fifth. 
Acosta has hit two batters and now walked one, so there have been runners on base, but as we said, he's done a great job of mitigating the damage, and he's already induced two double plays, looking for a third here, who would come off the bat of Ben Nemevan, who's a ground ball hitter. Singled on a ground ball in the first, and rounded out four to three in the third. Looks like we're going to have a pinch runner for Bobo as Chase Greaves, or Graves rather, running number four comes in. So Graves for Bobo is a pinch runner. And he'll likely take over in center field in the bottom half of the fifth inning. So again, Graves for Bobo, whose day ends one of two with the base hit on a walk. Nemavant, wide open stance, the old school look and no batting gloves from the left side. Costa whips that slider in there beautifully, and he's had that thing hanging all day. He's had it really dropping and doing a great job of fooling these opponent hitters. Yeah, we were talking to our statistician who's on the stat man, stat tracker here. That slider is moving almost two feet with the with the velocity and the and the movement that's coming down. And Mavan hits it off the end of the bat. A cue shot to short. Fielded by Myro, sliding in head first and safely at first is Nemavan. You don't see too many head first slides at first, but he's able to just beat it out on an infield single that moves the pinch runner Graves up to second base. And I love the aggressiveness right there of Nemavan, but at 18 to 1. One of my coaching stat, uh, uh, talks, come, him coming back to the dugout would be, hey, dude, I appreciate the effort, but we need to keep you healthy. Especially for their number two hitter and one of their starting outfielders who's projected to be one of their top hitters throughout the year. Two on with one out, as this is the shortstop, Mecho. And that curveball right there, is, we're getting the, the stats that that curveball is coming in almost 10 inches. So, and that, that does not include any type of drop. That's actual movement on the ball. So it's definitely more when you include the effect of gravity in there. As Metro pops it up down the right field side. Pinaro battling with the sun, moving into foul ground, towards the fence, slides and makes the catch. Both runners tag up the throw to the cutoff man, Rodriguez. What a play by Pinaro on a ball twisting away from him, sliding and making the grab in foul territory. Did a great job of getting over there and gauging where that ball was going to end up. Ended up going to a slide, but the beauty of that was the way he popped up and hit the cutoff man to limit the damage right there. I think that the runners were going to advance either way, but sometimes a guy will kind of lay there for a second and allow a runner from second to come all the way around. But uh, Pinaro did a great job. That's a hustle play. Yeah, he didn't look like he was sliding to make a catch. He looked like he was sliding into second on a double. I mean, he popped up quickly, spun around, and fired to Rodriguez. You'd love to see it. There's Jeremy Lee from the right side. Two on now, two down for the catcher. Beautiful slider that started out on the front shoulder. That thing doesn't break. It hits him on the arm, and instead it drops right down the middle for a called strike. And we saw that last inning where he did let one get away, didn't have the spin, and ended up hitting uh, the batter right in the butt. Here's Lee, who was hit earlier in the game on a fastball. This fastball hits him on the leg. He does stand especially close to the plate, and he's earned his way on twice. Yeah, and I'm not sure at that point. I know Acosta's working on his repertoire and his what all his pitches right there, but he's been throwing that slider and that curveball so well. I'm just not sure that the fastball was warranted at that point. That instance, especially to that batter, just keep it going. Keep firing those breaking balls in there. He's had luck with it all day, but now the bases are loaded with two down. Trying to keep them all stranded out there up against Peyton Miller now is Acosta. Looking out of the stretch with nowhere to put the batter. Breaking ball just outside. That was the slider. The Tigers over the last three days have had, actually had bases loaded a few times. Just haven't been able to capitalize on them and stranded a lot of, a lot of batters. Yeah, they stranded the bases loaded twice on Friday. They did it once yesterday. Miller might do it here as he pops it up to shallow right field. Going back is Rodriguez. Panaro calls him off and makes the catch. So stranding the bases loaded is Pacific. They go just six batters in that inning. And the Rebels hold them off the board. Overall, no runs on one hit, no errors, and three men stranded on base. With that, we've played half a ball game. Four and a half down, four and a half to go. The Rebels on top big, 18 to 1.
championships and help our student athletes excel at all that they do by visiting rebelathleticfund.com. UNLV Baseball brought to you by Intermountain Healthcare. Here to be a part of your Las Vegas life. More importantly, here to help you live an even healthier one. Intermountain Healthcare, official health partner of UNLV Athletics. Top of the Rebels lineup, set to get her going in the bottom of the fifth inning. Officially, the back half of today's action is Ryland Charles, Santino Pinaro, Jacob Sharp. First three scheduled to hit. We'll be keeping an eye on the on deck circle really for the entirety of this game. Trying to get some younger players. Some at bats as Charles swings to the first pitch from Stout. It's it high in the air to center field. Tony Otis had shifted from right to center. He drifts back, makes the catch in front of the warning track. One pitch, one out here in the bottom of the fifth inning. As mentioned, Otis moved from right to center field. Chase Graves, who came in to pinch hit for John Howard Bobo, moved from center to right field. Of course, Jack Mecho still in at shortstop. Caden Casagrande still in at first base. There is a new catcher. It's Andrew Sloan hitting, or rather fielding for Jeremy Lee. So Sloan catching and Graves in right, the two new defenders in the field for Pacific. Meanwhile, here's Santino Pinar, who's had himself a day. Takes a called strike from Tyler Stout. Pitching in his third inning of work, he came in and got the final two outs of the third, and then all three outs. Pretty quick and easy succession, all things considered, in the fourth. And he's right around the 86 to 88 on the fastball. Kind of getting the pitch count up a little bit. We do have a little bit of uh, activity out in the bullpen. But I think they're going to try to ride Stout as long as they can to get some uh, some innings out of him. There's a right-hander with a ball in his hand out in the left field bullpen. As his pitch way high to Panaro. We do have a pinch hitter on deck as Chase Gallegos. Looks like he's going to hit for Jacob Sharp. So Williams, Krizik, and Horvat already lifted. And we're going to see the carousel continue. Pitch inside is Santino. And the count three balls and one strike to the Rebels' number two batter. He's single, he's doubled, he's reached on a fielder's choice, and the only put out he made was on a ground ball in the third, which drove in a run. So a productive out, one of two RBIs on the day for the Bishop Gorman Gales. He takes a five pitch walk, reaches for the fourth time in five plate appearances today. And here comes Gallegos in his first plate appearance of the year. Yeah, we talked last night on the broadcast about the importance of having that backup catcher. Well, you kind of got, kind of be with Gallegos and with, um, with Coy and the Volgi. So those guys are kind of inter interchangeable. You know, Gallegos, good looking kid out of Lo Liberty High School here in Las Vegas, listed at 6'1, 185. Really good looking kid that didn't get a lot of play last year, ended up redshirting. So they're interested to see what he can do. Right handed hitter with a slightly open stance. Here's a first pitch fastball that flips the outside for a strike. Chase Dittmar waiting on deck, another local product, but Gallegos, the true sophomore at 6'1, 185 pounds. He played just 10 games during his senior year of high school. He's 11 of 37, makes for a 367 average, the home run and 11 driven in. Drives this one straight back, so the count quickly nothing and two in his first at bat in the scarlet and gray. As you mentioned, didn't play it all last year. It's a, a tough way to crack the lineup with it. Eric Bajani in the lineup all last year. You knew that the opportunities for the number two spot at the catcher were going to be few and far between. Well, and you got a, a guy like Gallegos that's going to handle your bullpen too, right? So during the games, he's down there working with those pitchers, making sure they're getting warmed up, making sure they're getting their reps. But it's also a good teaching point for him because he's seeing as many pitches as he can possibly get. So when he is inserted, he knows the pitchers. He knows the habit. He knows the location. So it's just going to be a good uh, learning curve for him. Easily translates for sure. 
One two to him. Hammer to left center field. That's fading and dropping for a base hit. Rounding second, heading to third is Santino Panaro. He's going to be in there safely as the throw goes to second base. Not fielded cleanly by Miller, but no further advancement. First college hit for Chase Gallegos. Congratulations there as he moves Panaro up two bags. And the parade continues offensively. And the first at bat of the day for Chase Dittmar, second of the series. Well, you look at uh, the last couple batters. You started with Charles. He's a Nevada guy. Then you got Panaro on third. Bishop Gorman guy. You got Gallegos, Liberty guy. Dittmar, who is a uh, basic high school guy. And then on, on deck, you got Sharman, who came from Desert Oasis. So, I mean, it's the Las Vegas gamut right now. Talked about it yesterday. Exactly half the roster from Vegas and Reno, if you want to include rather than Charles and the Nevada-based players. We, t we, we, don't, we don't like to say that word. <laughs> he's from the northern he's, part of the he's state. He's from Nevada. Uh, first pitch in for a strike to Chase Dittmar. Runners on the corners and one down here in the bottom of the fifth inning. Right on right matchup is Stout Deals. This is way outside. The new catcher Sloan having to twist around to keep that one in front. Notice when I looked down to the bullpen in the left field corner the last time that there is a, a second arm out there and he was waving a hat towards the dugout. Typically, that's when you have a spotter out there and he'll say, you wave the hat when he's ready. And the hat was waving, so Stout may not be long for this game. Misses this one badly, nearly back to the backstop. Credit right to Sloan for keeping that one in front. Yeah, Stout's overthrowing a little bit. Tumbled off the mound the last couple pitches, trying to throw that heater. Chance for Chase Dittmar. Almost, you kind of want to put the score out of your mind if you're, you know, Chase Dittmar or Noah Rodriguez or some of these younger players getting in. This one's hit over the head of the first baseman on a bounce in the right field. A 90-foot advancement for Gallegos. Panaro scores from third base. Now 19 to 1 the score in the bottom of the fifth inning. RBI on the single for Chase Dittmar. And I believe that's going to be a 19th hit in 26 official at bats for the Rebels. So we talked about the second in the country last year at 326. I don't know what the stats are going to look like coming out tomorrow through D1 baseball, but I got to imagine we're going to be pretty good. Absolutely. And you know, certain players like Pimentel or Krizak are going to have some nation leading numbers after this weekend as Jason Sharman in from the left for his second plate appearance takes a called ball one down low. He lined out to left on the first pitch he saw back in the fourth. You got Austin Krizak with eight RBIs already. Alex Pimentel with an on base percentage uh, otherworldly number 13 out of 14 times he's reached. Still have some baseball to play as this pitch is outside to Sharman 2 0. Yeah, you sure you really like to see this, especially with that opening weekend. You're getting a lot of guys in certain the lineup to get some experience, but you got to keep things in perspective, too. We come up against Arizona State on Tuesday, um, and then we're going to be playing a four game series next week in San Diego against much better competition. So this is good momentum to carry, but let's keep it within ourselves. Let's make sure that we're keeping th this thing in really good perspective. Sharman had. No plate appearances last year in just one appearance, but two years ago was a 300 batter. He's a really streaky hitter when he can. He's another loud batting practice guy, especially from the left side. Drives this one the other way, but drifts it foul into that active Pacific bullpen. Well, you take a look at a kid like him. When he came in, he was a skinny little guy, right? You look at the forearms on this kid right now. So he's really taken the strength and conditioning program here to another level. Dare I say Dan Ugla on the forearms? I'm not sure we're that point, but you know, he, <laughs> he can hold his own. He's getting there. It's this ground ball to the left side, fielded by the shortstop Metro. The turn at the bag. It's second by Miller. His throw to first, just in time. An inning ending 6 4 3 twin killing. But UNLV adds on with a run on two hits, one runner left on, and through five innings full, 19 to 1, the big time lead for the home side.
Top of the six from early Wilson Stadium, 19 to one, a big time lead for UNLV and making his collegiate debut, the six foot six right-hander out of Olympia, Washington, Jordan Hansen, pride of Tumwater High School, up against Rylan Evans to lead things off. First pitch just outside. We talked projectable frame all weekend and Jordan Hansen, the premier example on this UNLV roster of a guy who projects to really do some special things on the hill. Yeah, we talked about him, like, I think on Fridays, Hitmar keeps it in front, rolling underneath the glove of the shortstop, Myro. And that one, likely a base hit, as that one was right at Dittmar. He got the chest on it. I'd be fine either way. The more I think about it, likely an error. Yeah, I think we're leaning more towards an error win on the official scorebook there. But, uh, I mean, the kid has a frame on him, like you talked about, this projectable frame. But he also has a lot of arm strength. And He's going to try to overpower people, I think, at this point in his career. Going to have to work on that breaking ball and the slider. is going to have to be right around, you know, the 83 to 84 mark for him to have a difference uh, compared to his fastball. He misses low on the first pitch. He throws to Jack Mecho, the right-handed batting shortstop. With the runner on and nobody out. Hanson's next pitch down the middle for a called strike. And that was an error that was uh, given to Dittmar at third. So he five. But for Hanson, the fastball anywhere from 86 to 88 in the preseason scrimmages, he definitely projects once he fills out on the bottom half to definitely light up some radar guns with that size. You can't teach height, and he's using it coming downhill there and gets a swing and a miss. Yeah, and his stretch towards home plate has got to be about six foot on the span from left to right. Yeah, he is, he is almost all legs, and it's a quick motion. Not a high leg kick as he just kind of slides it towards the dish. Line drive off the glove of the second baseman. Rodriguez able to recover. The feed to Myro's in time. Myro's sort of first is down the line, but I think the runner was going to be safe anyway on a fielder's choice. So a 4 6 put out up the middle. Good job by Rodriguez to just keep the glove in front of it and, and not panic immediately when he doesn't field it cleanly to get the out at second base. Yeah, that bending one hopper that gets towards you, he just stayed in front of it, made sure that actually after he took it off the chest, he made the sure out at second base job to make sure they get the one out and now with a runner on first and one out one pitch away is Hanson can get a ground ball off the bat of Andrew Guidara from the left this one twists inside nearly clips him on the jersey but Guidara the DH gets out of the way one of two so far with an RBI base hit in the second the only RBI so far for Pacific he also struck out looking against Joey Acosta who's in line for the win this pitch misses downstairs the final line for Acosta Five innings, he gave up one run on six hits in a walk. He hit two batters and struck out three, including the final two of the fourth inning. And again, Acosta after throwing five innings in line for the win. Line drive, right center field, it's down. Splits the outfielders as Pinaro's able to get back behind it. Heading from first to second is the runner, and the throw not in time as Kidara with a one-out double moves runners into second and third with one down for the number nine hitter, Tony Otis, now playing in center. Good bit of hitting right by guy Gadera right there. Finding the gap, runners advance, and he was going to be moving towards second base. A little bit of a closer play than I thought it was going to be off the relay, but Gadara was able to get down under the tag. Gadara safely at second. Here's Otis in from the right. Hansen with a true three pitch mix, fastball slider changeup. Goes with the fastball here and misses outside. You know, the tendency for a freshman like him with that type of frame. At high school, he dominated with that fastball. 
he's going to have to be able to come back with a, a multitude of pitches, the slider, the the the, the curveball. But more importantly, I think he's got to develop a changeup coming off of, you know, projected, you know, 92, 93 miles an hour over the next couple of years. If he develops that changeup, he's going to be pretty lethal. And he's sitting 91 to 92 on the fastball today. And he can tunnel a change up from that same arm slot. It could be really effective, especially with the intimidation factor that he brings. A high leg kick and the breaking balls chopped to Dittmar at third. The runner breaking immediately, but Dittmar's throw is going to be to first base. So run scoring ground out by Tony Otis. It's Pacific back on the board, now trailing 19 to 2. So some offensive life, but with two outs in the top of the lineup due up. Here is Chase Graves wearing number four. The Rebels chose to take the out for the run right there. I think Detmar comes home. The runner is going to be out by at least five feet. The Rebels are just trying to get through this right now, work on some mechanics, get the out, try to give uh, Hanson some uh, support. Hanson with a big overhand curveball that stays high. A lot of times, too, the defense will tell you what they're doing based on their positioning. And that time, you know, 18 runs at the time, with the infield shaded deep, you're just trying to get an out. You're not trying to gun down the runner at the plate necessarily. So Dittmar knew that from where they were positioned. And a, a smart play to just take the sure thing out as Hansen gets a called strike on a fastball. And just watching Hansen, just off this short sample that we've got right now, he does drop down a little bit on the fastball. He's a little more over the top on the curveball. There's a breaking pitch that stays outside for ball two. Graves. Came in as a pinch runner for the center fielder Bobo back in the fifth inning after he walked. Was stranded on third when Acosta got out of dodge and stranded the bases loaded in what turned out to be his final inning. Slapped ball, fouled off down the right field side, and the count now two and two with two outs and a runner on second base. Again, we talked about the Rebels going down to ASU on Tuesday. Uh, travel day tomorrow. Really no days off for the Rebels this week because we've got a four game series that starts Friday in San Diego. Foul ball, able to stay alive there is Graves. And hey, we talked a little bit about that Tony Gwynn Memorial Classic. Tell us a little bit more because you've been there multiple times. It is a, a really cool, unique feel that they play at multiple sites in Southern California. Yeah, the, the home stadium is the San Diego State campus, but we also use USD. And this year they've added UCSD, which uh, had a big win last night against the top 25 uh, opponent. Um, so you're, you're seeing some good mix of Washington State, UCSD, Irvine, which had a really good program over the years. Um, so you, you're getting a lot of that ball's hammered into center field. It's going to drop. Plays coming to the plate, and the runner is going to be tagged out with no slide. Wow, what a play to get around the bat first off by the base runner, and then to be able to apply the tag there for Gallegos. That's a big time play and an outfield assist from Ryland Charles to end the top of the sixth inning with the score 19 to two.
batting number four, Braden Murphy. Six, seven, and eight due up for the home side to begin the home half of the sixth inning. And it's been all UNLV, not only did this weekend, but mainly today in a 19-2 final. It wins a 14-6 and 8-3 for UNLV in each of the first two games against Pacific as Braden Murphy stands in against the new arm, Daniel Barrera, from the right side. Yeah, but Pacific has been in each of the previous games. Today, it's been all Rebels from the jump. Yeah, this one was pretty much over after the third inning there, putting up that 11th spot. Now they're able to get some of the younger guys and some of the subs in. So I think we're going to see a couple new batters this evening. We've got one on deck and Andrew Kirshner, first baseman, as Murphy skies this one to right field, drifting back is Graves. Graves just in front of the warning track and now moving in, able to make the catch. Murphy skies out to right in his second plate appearance. He doubled back in the fourth when he was initially inserted into the game. Rather, he's been in from the jump. With all these, these pinch hitters and substitutes coming in, tough to keep track, but we've got one here for Alex Pimentel. It's Andrew Kirshner making his collegiate debut. Nine, yeah, Kirshner listed at 6'5", 190, out of Gar High School in Southern California's town of Cerritos. This is a guy that they're counting on to develop over the next couple of years and be able to play actually multiple positions. He's an outfielder and first baseman. He's coming in for Pimentel, so we'll see if they elect to kind of rotate this designated hitter spot over the next couple of innings, if they are able to make another trip or two to the plate. As Kirshner tomahawks this one through the right side of the infield for his first collegiate base hit. And that one above the zone, somehow at six foot five, he found that pitch up by the chin and just rolled it over through the right side of the infield with some pop. He had a little tomahawk to that, but he got over the top of it. And that's that's where he you know was able to find the hole there. You know, he's listed at 6'5", 190 pounds. Doesn't look 190 pounds to me. And when they get him in the strength and conditioning and the training table program here, I think he's going to translate into a big body. Good pop off the bat. That one, 98 on the exit velocity. It brings up Paul Myro the fourth, one of the lone starters still in this one. Myro, two hits, a walk, and he's reached via an error as well. He's ahead, one ball, no strikes, as the catcher Sloan receives it. Now keeping an eye, same defensive alignment for Pacific. Daniel Barrera comes in behind Tyler Stout. Stout, as we said earlier, just kind of tasked with laboring and getting through. He was able to get through two and a third as that pitch misses high. Charge for six runs, five earned on nine hits, two walks and zero strikeouts. Of course, the starter, Jake Tandy, is the pitcher of record for the visiting Pacific Tigers. One of the reasons I think you're seeing Myro still in the rotation with the injury to Higgins yesterday, Murphy moves over to first, who's usually back up to either second or short. So, and then you have uh, Gallegos in the game at second. So really, they don't have a lot of opportunity or options right now at short. Really nobody, nobody left to back him up. Williams lifted from the game. Horvat lifted from the game. Dittmar in at third. Kirshner in at the DH spot right now. Yeah, just looking through the lineup, or the roster rather. There really is nobody else to back up Paul Myro at this point. This one hits him, although right on the upper part of the arm. That's one of the better places to get hit if you're going to get it and up on that, that deltoid area in the top of the shoulder. It is, but that's one of those ones that uh, if that ends up being an injury and you're stuck with him being in the lineup because he didn't have any backup, you're a little disappointed in that. But he's all right, jogging down to first base, got him on the meaty part of the upper arm. And that brings up Noah Rodriguez for his second at bat. He's hoping it goes better than his first. He grounded into an inning ending around the horn. 5-4-3 double play in the fourth. I noted Gallegos was at second, but it's actually Rodriguez here. Yeah, Rodriguez batted 461 in his senior year of high school. So a, a top hitter at La Mirada High School in La Habra, California. And definitely projects as a, a true second baseman, similar in stature to Gianni Horvath. Chops this one up the middle. Charging is the shortstop. Mecho doesn't field it cleanly. Everybody's safe everywhere. Score that one an E6, and that'll bring up Ryland Charles with the bases loaded and one out here in the home half of the sixth. Yeah, that's one that you feel for Mecho at short. You know, he came in as a, as a substitute there. Easy play. Sometimes he's just rushing that. He could decide whether he was going to take the bag himself or make the flip over to second. And unfortunately, sometimes when you're, you're kind of thinking about what's going on, you don't make the initial play. That was one where you could almost see the gears churning between the ears. And typically on a play like that, you want the shortstop to take it. As Charles crushes this one deep in the air to right field. Going back is Graves. He'll turn around. It's off the top of the wall. 
Kirshner scores, getting the wave from second is Myro. The throw from the cutoff man is up the line, in, standing and safely is Myro. It's a two-run base hit for Ryland Charles. He missed a home run by about a foot. That ball was absolutely crushed just off the star nursery sign out there in right center. And that ball traveled about 370 feet, 375 being the top of the fence. What's interesting right there is that Charles ended up only on first base here because the runner didn't advance from first, that being Rodriguez. Not sure he got held up by, by Coach Higgins, but it looked like Hick, Coach Higgins was a little bit uh, annoyed that he didn't at least take third. It, Ch and Charles kind of threw his hands up like, what are we doing here? That's about the longest single that Ryland Charles has had at UNLV. And brings up Santino Panaro, who's been nearly perfect this afternoon. Nice looking curveball dropped in there by Daniel Barrera. This is the second outing for Barrera of the season already. He came in and threw a scoreless seventh inning against the Rebels back on Friday night, including a strikeout of Charles and Gianni Horvat. He did a great job in his lone inning of work, a single inning reliever to be sure. He's a hard thrower and gets a foul ball straight back from Santino Panaro to move the count nothing and two. So officially, we've got 18 hits off 30 official at bats. Again, I can't do the math very well, but that's uh, that's pretty darn good. For a team that led the country in, in batting average last year, that's that's pretty darn good. Is it 18 to 30? Correct. It's a 600 batting average. Not too bad. Not too bad. When you, you consider on Friday night, we hit almost 400. Little down day yesterday, hitting 320. Oh, boo-hoo. <laughs> I don't know many people that'll feel bad for the Hustle Rebels after that performance yesterday, and even less that'll feel bad for them after today. But again, we got to follow this up now, right? That's the thing, and it's a, a tough opponent. A couple of tough opponents coming up. That one to the backstop. That was a breaking pitch that slipped out of the hand immediately. That wild pitch will move Rodriguez to third and Charles up to second base. But well, we were looking at the upcoming schedule for Pacific. The upcoming schedule for UNLV, extremely tough. You've got Arizona State, Blue Blood on Tuesday. You've got the Tony Gwynn Memorial Tournament. But then the game on March 1st, the next home game, next time we'll be on the broadcast, is against Grand Canyon, who's having a stellar start to the season. Who actually took out the number one team in the nation last night, Tennessee. Um, so we're going to go from, you know, a team that's struggling a little bit with Pacific, and we're going to find out where we are really quick. Because then you're going to talk about San Diego State coming here to start not conference play. Then we go to Oklahoma. So, you know, we're going to find out where we are. It is a really tough schedule, especially after that set against San Diego State. I'll tell you that in a moment because it gets even tougher somehow. This 3-2 pitch way upstairs. Looks like Barrera lost it during that at bat. That'll load the bases for Chase Gallegos. But the, the schedule following Grand Canyon, who beat the number one team in the country, and San Diego State typically at the top of the Mountain West, a really tough three weeks for UNLV on the road. They're at Oklahoma for two games, at Cal Poly out of the Big West for three, at Arkansas for two, at Reno for two. They go to Cal Baptist on March 21st before returning home to take on a tough Fresno State team on March 24th. I want to talk about scheduling in terms of RPI. That's what they did this year for sure. Yeah, and that's a tough stretch, but that was that 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 was actually very methodical for yeah. the coaching staff to get that RPI RPI up. You have to get on the road playing good teams. Play good teams, they will. This pitch way upstairs, and Barrera with an arm up behind him in the bullpen looks like he cannot find the strike zone after he was so strong on Friday. Yeah, Friday he was up in the zone also, and we chased it, unfortunately, a few times. He's got three runners on. It's Rodriguez at third, Charles at second, Panaro on first. Watching all the way is Chase Gallegos, who takes a strike on the outside. Gallegos singled back in the fifth inning, his first hit, and his first at bat for UNLV. No wind to speak of. The outfield playing deep. As Gallegos leads away from this one. We talked about you know, Grand Canyon in some of these early season tournaments, there's a, a ton of action going on around uh, Division One this weekend and a lot of games involving teams that UNLV is going to play later in the year. Yeah, looking at the Mountain West out of town scoreboard. That walk will keep the bases loaded and bring in a run. So an RBI for Gallegos on a bases loaded free pass. That brings up Chase Dittmar in a similar situation with the sacks full. Air Force beats Army 9-3 at the Armed Forces Classic back east. Oregon State lead, or 
final note, just goes final. Oregon State beats New Mexico 14 to six. That was after the Lobos defeated the Beavers the other day. Correct. Top of the eighth, Michigan State leads Fresno State five to four at the MLB Desert Invitational down in Arizona. The score 22 to two here. Rebels taking care of business on a Sunday against Pacific. And it looks at least offensively, like they, they've picked up where they left off last year and then some. Dinmar rolls one through the left side of the infield, a chopped ball that'll bring home another run. It's a 21 run advantage now for UNLV here in the home half of the sixth. Mm. My thoughts exactly. Looking at a couple more of the out of town scores. Bottom of the seventh, the team up north tied with Abilene Christian 4-4 with Abilene Christian taking the first two out of that three-game series. That's been a tough weekend for the Wolfpack as another darn pinch runner stands in here at first base. Top of the ninth, Arizona State leads San Diego State 1-0. And San Jose State leads Loyola Marymount 6-2 in the bottom of the fourth. And Nolan George pinch running at first. He's a pitcher, but they're having him run at first base. So Chase Dinmar is going to be lifted from the game, and we'll see who goes in at third base. Yeah, that one's going to be a little bit of a mystery. I mean, up, up. I'm, look, I'm looking over at your scorebook. It, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff on that. I've gone through almost a, a whole pen today alone. Somehow able to keep track of it as Barrera gets a called strike up against Jason Sharman, who has grounded into a double play and lined out sharply to left field. Days like today, you got to bring an extra pin or two to the yard. Charmin crushes this one deep in the air to right center field. He'll turn around and watch it bounce off the top of the fence. One run scores. Here comes the runner from second. It's Gallegos. He'll score standing up as Charmin saunters into second with a two RBI double. Much like Ryland Charles, he missed a home run by just a foot or two. Yeah, almost in the exact same spot that Charles hit his earlier in the inning. That ball was absolutely crushed. And that uh, is the first hit for Sharman this game. So that means everybody that's been in the lineup, including all pinch hitters, have a hit today. And we'll see if Nolan George gets an at bat, because that would be a pitcher hitting. And we'll see. He's on third base now as Barrera's lifted from the game with the score 25 to 2. And the parade continues out of the Pacific bullpen. Back out for his second trip to the mound, Owen McWilliam. He was a position player as a pinch hitter yesterday. Comes in with 
Pacific trailing UNLV 25 to 1. And after a double off the top of the wall from Jason Sharman, that was 102 miles an hour off the bat. Here's Braden Murphy in his second at bat of the sixth inning. Takes a called strike one from Owen McWilliam, the 5'11 sophomore out of Bainbridge Island, Washington. Earlier this very inning, Braden Murphy flying out to right to begin the inning. Since then, nobody recorded an out. Eight straight Rebels reached following. Left-handed batting. Braden Murphy rips one foul, pulled it down the first base side, and he falls behind nothing in two. For Daniel Barrera, you can't close the book on him yet with Dittmar on third and Sharman off second, his responsibility. But so far, Barrera, six runs, just three earned on four hits over a third of an inning. That was after he shut the Rebels down, one, two, three, back on Friday night. This pitch just off the outside to Murphy. A good 0-2 miss by Owen McWilliam, who is playing in his second game of his second season with Pacific. The other night, two-thirds of an inning. Yesterday, rather two days ago, he was in the lineup. Yesterday, he pitched, so just need an arm to get him through the rest of this inning. Is Murphy lines one down the left field side. Nemovant can't get there. He's able to cut it off. One run scores, and replacing him at third base will be Jason Sharman. That's Nolan George, the pinch runner, touching it up. Make it 26 to two. The Rebels continue to blast their way to a lead here in the bottom of the sixth. Yeah, 26 to two with two on and one out in the inning with a couple more to play. It's a reminder of last year playing at New Mexico and in Albuquerque. The Rebels put up 27 on the Lobos for a final score of 27 to 6. Those games are hard to watch, as is this one. So with 26 to 2, that a run differential, but they look like they're going to be far from done from scoring if this keeps up. As Andrew Kirshner stands in for his second collegiate at bat, second at bat of the inning. He singled on a tomahawk chop down the right field side back earlier in this very frame. And we saw Stan Stolte go out and have a word with umpire uh, Tyler Schmidt behind home plate between innings. And, you know, in a game like this, you hate to assume in baseball because you got to go out there and get every out typically. But the conversation we were told needed to be had pregame as far as a mercy rule. But with the score 26 to 2 and Pacific on a getaway day running out of pitchers, they, they may have waved the white flag as far as that conversation is concerned. Correct. And I don't know what the adjustment can make be made in game, but. Uh if it can be made, I think it'd be good for both teams. I don't, I don't think you would find any player, coach, staffer contesting that at, at this point. We're 26 to two in the bottom of the sixth inning. It's been all Rebels all day. Five runs in the first, runs in three separate innings. They scored 11 in the third that really has broken it open. And then seven runs so far here in the sixth. As Kirchner, it's a ground ball knocked down by the first baseman, Casagrande. He fields it standing on the bag, but scoring is Sharman. And that'll make it 27 to 2. So a 25 point lead. A run lead. I'm thinking football here. This is a football score here at 25 to 7. And that'll bring up Paul Myro, the shortstop. So a three unassisted ground out for Kirshner. Give him an RBI. Three unassisted ground out to bring up Myro. Murphy waiting off second base. Mayo takes a breaking ball, bounces off the foot of the batter, and back in its second is Murphy. So the Rebels with eight runs in the six after an 11-run third. Mayo, the 12th batter of this inning. They batted around twice this game. Usually you don't do that in the series. Owen McWilliams set, just trying to get out of this sixth inning however he can. Misses high to Myro in the count. Those two balls and no strikes to the Rebel shortstops. Last year, Owen McWilliam didn't pitch at all. In 12 games that he appeared in, he started two, was 0 for 11 at the plate. Two thirds of an inning and got out of a jam two days ago. Snaps a big breaking curveball that stays inside to Myro and brings the count three balls and no strikes. It's Noah Rodriguez awaiting on deck. It's funny, they've gotten down into the roster where only Caleb Duncan has not appeared in this game as well as Fred Bone, the two catchers. And uh, yeah, everybody else getting playing time. So you, you do like that aspect of this one if you're Stan Stolte and the coaching staff that everybody's getting in. You really don't have any other bench bats to go to. Yeah, um, and, and you know, if you're looking at Coach Rodriguez over at uh, UOP, 
You know, the Tigers, this is experience, right? They're obviously very young. This is an opportunity for him to do a lot of coaching. Him and his staff are really going to have to get after that, right? So, although they're obviously at the, the really wrong end of a really crooked game here, it, it will be a chance for him to get with his team, talk about it. They're going to be playing teams that are more on their level. They got the University of Milwaukee next week. So I would anticipate if they stay and play as scrappy as they've been playing, they're going to they're going to scratch out some wins. Yeah, a team last year that was 14 and 38, but the the road woes from last year continue. They were three and 22 away from Stockton last year. But they did have three players go on the draft. They did. They were a really good team when they were playing at home. They had some really skilled individual players as Rodriguez checks the swing. They appeal down to first. Alberto Ruiz signals that he did not go around in the count. One ball, one strike to Rodriguez, who's over two, but did reach on an error earlier this inning. With McWilliam, I think he, you know, he may be it. There's not a, anybody in the dugout, or excuse me, the bullpen right now. There's a couple guys just kind of leaning up against the fence. Rodriguez chops it right back to the pitcher, and McWilliam taking care of business himself as he makes the underhand flip to first base. The Rebels with another crooked number here in the six, scoring eight runs. They sent 13 batters to the plate. We've played six full, a 27-2 lead for UNLV. Taking over atop the mound, making his collegiate debut, Reese Lewick out of Palo Verde High School. He'll do it against a pinch hitter for Pacific, Caden Peterson. In from the right side, the outfielder playing in a 27-2 game. And if you want playing time, you got it today. Even if you're a pitcher wanting to play in the field, Nolan George came in as a pinch runner for Chase Dittmar and stays in the game defensively at third base. We'll see on any balls hit in that direction. Just how the confidence is George over at the hot corner. So Nemavant out. Again, the pinch hitter, Caden Peterson, fouls the first pitch he sees off down the right field side. Luke, a highly regarded pitcher coming out of Palo Verde High School here in Las Vegas. He was the 5A Desert Pitcher of the Year. So balls tapped down to first base, taken solo by Braden Murphy for the first out of the inning. He was also uh, All-State. He logged uh, 34 innings of work out of the bullpen yesterday, last year for a 2.42 ERA. So, and this is a guy that uh, Corey Vanderhoek has talked about a live arm. And if you watch his motion right here, he's got quite a bit of whip uh, for a right-hander. Maybe the most interesting thing about him is his major, the culinary major. Which, you know, if you're at UNLV, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be a culinary major. There isn't a fine dining in this town. It's he gets that fastball in for a called strike to go even against Jack Mecho, who is 
0 for 1, flat out to right. The scorebook an absolute mess at this point in the game with uh, just how many times the Rebels have batted around, how many unique batters they've had, and how many pinch hitters and defensive replacements both teams have had. I'm going to run out of ink here soon. Check swing on a slider outside, able to hold up on the appeal, says Alberto Ruiz, the first base umpire. Well, Luke, if you watch his whip here, he actually hides the ball. That ball's not coming out to the he's, he's got his front foot planted. Very hard to pick up. Yeah, does a great job of keeping the hands low. And when the, the hand and glove separate, that's a big movement that a lot of you know, pitching pundits and coaches will look for is that first move when the hands separate. He does it kind of behind the hip, which makes it tougher for the batter to pick it up until the hand comes over the top and behind the head. Does it here on a high grounder to the first base side. Nice grab by Noah Rodriguez on a short hop, and the second baseman's lightly lofted flip to first base is in time. Rodriguez did a great job of not only getting around that, but getting the chest over top of it, should he have not have fielded that one cleanly. He did, and there's now two away in the seventh. We talked about it earlier when he made a play going towards the bag. He moved his feet, right? A lot of times you'll see guys reach out because they kind of get caught in no man's land right there, but he was able to get under that ball. Andrew Sloan swinging at the first pitch, a ground ball roller down the first base side. Bullpen arm emerges. Oh, what a grab. Makes the flip into the seat on a nothing in one count to the catcher, Jeremy Sloan. Or Andrew Sloan, rather, hitting for Jeremy Lee. Sloan's second at bat of the game begins one and one after Lewick misses outside. So this is a great opportunity for this coaching staff after Joey Acosta leaves well in line for the win, about as much as he's had in a UNLV start. He went Hanson for an inning. Lewick now able to get the first two outs and the third out in quick succession. Three straight ground outs to three different infielders. So far so good for Lewick, and we've reached the stretch break here at the Earl. At the top of the seventh, no runs, no hits, no errors, and none left on base. Coming out of the stretch break in the bottom of the seventh inning. The top of the Rebel lineup set to get it going against Owen McWilliam. Back out for a second inning of work. A new left fielder who pinch hit was Chase Peterson. Peterson out in left field. No more Ben Nemovans. We're getting down to the bottom of the barrel in terms of both rosters. Is Ryland Charles along with Santino Panaro still two starters in the game for UNLV. McWilliam deals out of the stretch as Charles takes a first pitch curveball in for a strike. It'll be interesting to see what the home plate umpire does with his strike zone, too. Do you widen it? I mean, they'll tell you they don't, but at a point like this in the game, they probably do. Especially on a Sunday on a getaway day, Pacific, heading home after this game as Charles hits a hot shot. Nice grab on one hot made by the second baseman. Miller, foot off the bag for the first baseman as Casagrande couldn't hold it. That'll be charged as a throwing error to the second baseman after an outstanding grab. Yeah, I think he actually had time to set his feet a little bit more. He kind of rushed that, took him back towards the home plate. And Charles runs real well, so 
uh, easily beats that throw after the first baseman's pulled off the ball, off the bag. Yeah, sometimes you kind of surprise yourself on a play like that. You go, oh, wow, I grabbed it. Got to make the play as quickly as you can. But on a ball that was as sharply struck as that, you've got plenty of time to get up, especially from the second base position, and make a throw. But he flashed a great glove, and for a freshman, he's had a heck of a weekend for, for the Tigers. Charles off first. His partner in the outfield, Panaro, batting for the seventh time today in the seventh inning. He takes a called ball and moves ahead 1-0. and Panaro has walked in each of his last two plate appearances. His two plate appearances in the third inning each ended with an RBI. One on a single, one on a ground out. He's also doubled and reached on a fielder's choice. He scored four of the Rebels' 27 runs today. Crushes this one deep in the air to right center field. Going back is Otis. Right fielder calls him off, and Chase Graves makes a stellar diving catch. So a couple of web gems here starting off the inning as Charles has to scamper back to first base. Yeah, nice job by Graves. He covered a lot of ground right there. Generally, you see the center fielder getting over to make that play, especially from a right-hander. So his glove side's there where the right fielder has to come all the way across and reach across his body to get that ball, but great play nonetheless. Yeah, I thought Otis was going to have a better beat on that, but then all of a sudden, like a streak of lightning, Draves came flying in from right field. Here's Chase Gallegos again. With Charles off first, and Nolan George awaiting on deck. Breaking ball, missing up. Gallegos and his two plate appearances so far has reached both times. He's singled, and he's walked, the second of which Came in a bases loaded situation, so he's earned himself an RBI today. And it'll be, George has mentioned, awaiting on deck the third different batter to do it in the fourth spot in the lineup. Swinging a foul ball, launched out of play. And we were talking during the inning break that this is without Kate Higgins as well, and this is the kind of pitching staff that Pacific has thrown out there today that he would likely feast on, those soft-throwing right-handers with the straight fastball. Yeah, and, you know, day-to-day, -day, and it's the right thing to do, He's got a little bit of a hammy problem, but uh, he's going to be fine, and uh, we'll probably see him back in the lineup on Tuesday night. That'll be a big one against his former school in Arizona State. Yeah, you, you almost have to tie him up to keep him out of that game. <laughs> he's going to be ready to go no matter what. But how about in the, the top of that seventh inning, Reese Lewick, the, the job that he did getting three weekly tapped ground outs in his college debut? You know, I love the motion. I love watching this kid on the mound, hiding that ball like we talked about around the hip. But the difference is, too, so a lot of times, as that ball's fouled back to the to the netting. You get a pitcher that hides the ball like that, the arm slot changes on pitch. And what we've seen right now, again, in a short sample, probably seven to eight pitches, everything was the same. It was consistent. And he was hitting 88 to 89 as a freshman. And that 88, 89 looks more like 91, 92 when you don't pick it up as early. That makes a big difference, especially at this level. Breaking pitch just outside. Good watch there by Gallegos, and the count goes full. Yeah, both of the relievers that have come in today, Lewick and Hansen, both freshmen, both making their debut, they were both excellent. Yeah, and that's all you want. You just want to eat up some innings, get them some experience, kind of take the shine off of that first time in the game, right? Because they're going to be counted on at critical points sometime during this season. And he goes, fouls this one off and is able to stay alive. Yeah, when your first outing is not in a pressure spot against a premier opponent, it can really make all the difference in the world because if you go out and get shelled, it kills your confidence. In a game like this, they're just going out there and getting their work and ho-hum, it's another day. Well, absolutely. And Roberts was closing out the game on Friday night. You know, he will tell you he was nervous as heck. Pop fly, straight back. That'll fly in the seats as Gallegos working along at bat here in the seventh. Yeah, Roberts was good. Hansen was good. Lewick was good. How about Sam Simon yesterday as well? Three plus innings. He was retroactively given the save, and he was really, really good. And we talked about it with Acosta today, but that frame really filled out in the offseason. Yeah, and if you're looking, you know, Sam's the batting that the Rebels have had over the last three days. If you're looking at pitching, I think that that was the shining star, the shining moment for the Rebels. When they see a guy like him be able to come in, eat up innings, keep the ball down in the zone, create a lot of, of, of ground balls, I mean, that's what we're going to need this year. We're going to need him at critical times. And that was their biggest challenge last year. The bats, obviously, they were, all year. they were one of the top hitting teams in the country all last year, but the pitching really struggled, especially late in the season. And now we've got a treat on our hands. Nolan George, a pitcher, making his first career at bat. Came in as a pinch runner, played an inning at third, and now hitting. Makes a curveball. He doesn't look too out of sorts in that right-hand batter's box. No, he looks pretty good, but I think... You know, if you, his heartbeat may be up about 150 right now. A six 190 pound sophomore out of Temecula, California, actually a career 301 batter in high school. So a true two way player at 
the prep level. He falls behind nothing in two after taking a curveball. Here's where the challenge really begins, is how is his two-strike approach looking? <laughs> I'm not sure he's got a lot of work on this this year. He just has the one approach. But the beauty of this, you know, it's, it's always fun to watch a pitcher bat for the first time, or very seldom that they get the chance to do it, is the approach at the plate. And he takes the curveball for strike three, a three-pitch at bat. He takes a call third strike for out number two. And this is not a knock on Nolan George because he's a big part of our pitching staff, but that is the exact reason that the DH is in the MLB. <laughs> George doesn't take the bat off the shoulder and strikes out looking on three pitches. And that'll bring up Jason Sharman with two on and two down in the bottom of the seventh inning. The Rebels at risk of not scoring for the first time all day. They played it at least a run in every other inning, including 11 in the third and eight in the sixth. Open stance from the left side for Sharman, who nearly missed a home run. He's lasted bat by just about a foot as he takes that breaking ball for a strike. There's been a couple of balls hit off that 375-foot marker in right center field. One by Sharman and then followed up by Charles in the next inning. Yeah, you know, tough matchup here because Sharman, he, he's, he's going to be up there free swinging. He does not get cheated as he pops this one up high deep to the right fielder. That one's shallow as Graves comes in, loses the cap as he does so, and is able to make the catch. And the Rebels, with their shortest inning of the day, they go down in five batters, don't score for the first time. But with that, we're on to the eighth. We'll be back from the Earl. Top of the eighth inning, 27 to two, the score with UNLV on top. Number 27, Peyton Miller batting for Pacific against the new arm. Another college debut is Jake Kassenpan. Set delivering on his first pitch, a bunt right back to the mound. The pitcher fields, Kassenpan's throw to first is in time. One pitch, one out. You'll take that if you're Kassenpan, even though a bunt down 25 runs is not typically something you see. No, um, that's a, that was him trying to bunt for a base hit. He's just trying to get on base. Kasson Path comes out of Arlington High School in Riverside, California. He was part of a 27-2 team his senior year. The first place finish in the River Valley Conference. So, so SoCal kid on this team as he gets ahead 0-1 on Ryland Evans. Yeah, don't have much of a book on him. We don't really know what is in his pitching arts arsenal, so we're going to kind of learn together here. We're, we're winging it. Hey, 
with all these guys making their debuts and even Nolan George getting the at-bat, we're, we're winging it with everything. This one's bounced in there. He did throw in a couple of the scrimmages preseason, you know, basically a two-pitch mix. Fastball anywhere from 84 to 88 and the slider in the upper 70s, low 80s. Pop fly hit down the right field side by the third baseman Evans. The first baseman Murphy heading towards the bullpen as he'll watch it bounce in there. That fastball slider mix, something you're starting to see a lot more prominently in Major League bullpens. You'll get these specialists that'll have 100 mile an hour fastballs and then breaking sliders. You don't see as many relief arms in the big leagues nowadays with a true three pitch mix. Sometimes they'll throw a change up in there, but that's just to say they have it in the arsenal. Well, think about it though. You're, you're over 100 miles an hour. What do you need? Just something else. Doesn't even matter what else. This one's hit in the air to left field. Charmin moving towards the line. It takes a bounce in front of him. As Evans reaches for the third straight at bat, his second via a hit. Yeah, I hate to date myself, but there was a time when I was a youngster and hitting 95. You know, J.R. Richards, Nolan Ryan, those guys, that was absolutely incredible. And then occasionally you'd see a 100-mile-an-hour guy. Now it's just consistent. Every team has that guy. Every team has multiple guys now. I mean, it is crazy the velocity renaissance that has taken place in upper-level baseball. And that extends all the way down to college as the first pitch is outside. To the first baseman, Caden Casagrande, in from the right. I mean, even at the college level, we saw Ben Joyce last year at Tennessee throwing 103 for the Volunteers. Well, we faced Paul Skeens last year. Yeah, yeah 98 miles an hour. It was 98 pitch the other night on Friday for LSU. Yeah, Paul Skeens, he, it was an interesting look for Skeens at Air Force. There's a, a lot that really is a, a positive and a lot to like about attending a service academy like that. But you look at a guy like that that was just such a stud on both sides of the ball. And we even said last year, he's got to get out of here and go to a premier program. And that he did, transferring to LSU. Well, absolutely. You know, at Arizona, as we get a Bach. A Bach call, advancing Evans up to second. But, you know, Skeens on Friday night would be the starting pitcher in a conference game. He would DH on Saturday and then catch on Sunday. So, you, you know, those types of players we don't see very much anymore, but his home is on the mound, and that's why he's going to be projected as a first uh, top five draft choice. Ground ball right side. Nice grab by the first baseman, Murphy. The flip to the pitcher covering was in time, but Kassenpanth never touched the base. He knew it right away. If he touched the base and knew it, he would have, uh, you know, contested that. Correct. But no look towards the umpire. Instead, he actually put the hat down. Murphy couldn't believe it, but I don't think he had the angle. Well, we talked about that earlier with uh, the Tigers and their freshmen at, at, on the mound and at first base, not getting their timing down there. Kassipanth made a really late break to get there, did get there in time, but just couldn't find the bag. And that's going to become more reps he gets, the more balls, the more practice time he gets, that's going to become routine for him. Pinch hitter is Max Bledy, wearing number 35, spelled B-L-E-D-Y. Checks the swing on a first pitch curveball that drops in for a called strike. Do you think I dated myself when said J.R. Richard? No, that's not, that's not too bad. But I'm going to guarantee you that if we ask the Rebel dugout, not too many people know who that is. This one's hit in the air to left center field. That'll get down. That'll score at least one run as Charles slips a bit picking it up. They're going to hold the runner at third. The throw goes to second. It's a two out or a two bagger, I should say. One out two bagger for Andrew Guidara. Moving Casagrande from first to third and scoring Evans from third base makes the score 27 to three. Good piece of hitting right there by the D.H. Gadara. Makes him two for three at this point, but went down low and got a ball that was able to drive into the gap in the left center. So here's Tony Otis. Swings of the first pitch. High chopper to the left side. Nolan George can't field it cleanly as one run scores. And that would have been a really tough play, but an error going to be charged to George, the pitcher playing at third. Yeah, you, you, you're talking about a guy that, uh, you know, it's kind of like... Um, you, you know you can make that play. He's In his mind, he had that play. But that ball, I'm not even sure he would have gotten out there. But, you know, he, he's doing a good job. He's just got to kind of have some fun out there right now. Rebels are having fun today. They, they still lead by 23 as Chase Graves stands in, swings at the first pitch, hits it high in the air to right center field. Panaro went to the gap to grab it, tagging up from third and not advancing. As Panaro fires this one towards the plate, Gidara no inclination to go there. Great job by Panaro. It's also tough when the outfielder has a full head of steam coming in on a play like that. Correct. And Panaro right there, you know, being the left-hander, he would have had to kind of pivot and, and throw, but they were going to test his arm right there. And there's no sense right now in any type of play at the plate where there might be an injury at this point. Caden Peterson stands in for his second plate appearance. The runner breaks from first. 
throw, not in time. It was a bit down the line. Typically, when you apply the tag to the backside, there's not going to be any kind of an out call. And Mike Sosha had a great quote way back in the day about uh, throws to second base. He says you always want to miss if you're going to miss to the right because there are no outs on the left side of second base on a stolen base attempt. Check swing on a ball down. They appeal to first. No, he didn't, says Alberto Ruiz. And the count, one ball and one strike to Peterson. And Rodriguez did a good job keeping that ball in front of his body also. Yeah, just not allowing that one to trickle out into center field and allow another run to score. It's a breaking ball at the knees for a called strike two. Ball and two strikes to Peterson, who replaced Nemavan, who was two for three. So Nemavan, Bobo, Myers, Lee, and Weiss all lifted from the game as far as the starting lineup for the Tigers. Similar look for the Rebels. Well, they've got a couple more starters in, solely because of the, the depth. As Gallegos blocks it and keeps the count two and two. You know, Castle Panther right here this is a great experience for him. He's getting some time in in a D1 baseball game playing high school ball last year. We've talked about this many a times with the Tigers pitches this year. This is really going to be good for the Rebel staff as that ball just drops out of the zone and barely misses for a full count now. But Kasselpan, right now, this these pitches are invaluable. You'd like to say, yeah, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get it, you know, five, six, seven uh, pitch count inning, but the more he throws, the more experience he's going to get and he's going to Kind of settle down a little bit. Line drive hit to the right side. Over the head of the diving second baseman and into right. One run scores. Panaro doesn't field it cleanly. And that will allow the second run to score. So scored an RBI single for Peterson. And I believe that Panaro will be charged for an error. That will allow the second run to score. So it's a four-run frame all of a sudden for Pacific as they've cut into the deficit. 27-6 to six the score. Uh, again, a good piece of hitting right there. Taking a low outside pitch opposite field. Panaro comes up with that cleanly. There might have been a pretty close play at the plate. He's got a good arm and was moving in. Instead, that'll bring up Metro, the shortstop. He takes a bouncing ball. Good block by, by Gallegos. We saw him in the pregame yesterday. He's got the, the new style hockey goalie style catcher's helmet, but the paint job reminiscent of Yadier Molina. I wonder if that's by design. Correct. And, uh, you know, you see that with uh, hockey matches these, these years the artwork and kind of brings out the personality and the players. So not sure what that stands for for Chase, but it's a great looking mask. Yeah, great gear this year from Evo Shield for all the catchers. Great gear across the board. It's a new partnership with Wilson. Everybody's got a custom glove. Nike always does a great job of outfitting this team, but you know, look good, feel good, play good. And I think the gloves make a big difference. Is this one chopped to the right side? Rodriguez picks it up on a short hop. He'll underhand it to first and it's in time. We can talk more about that Wilson partnership when we return. Pacific on the board for four runs in the top half of the eighth inning, a 27-6 score.
Bogey. Bottom of the eighth, Rebels due up for the final time, leading big time, 27 to six, among the top five in terms of runs scored in a game in Rebels history. It's Cole and Devolge pinch hitting for Braden Murphy. He'll do it against the Aussie on the hill, Jared Wood. Pitching for the second time in the series, and Devolge pops the first pitch straight back, going aggressive here in the bottom of the eighth. Wood through two days ago in the opening game of the series and was able to close it out in a 1-2-3 fashion. He actually struck out Cole and Devolge to begin the bottom of the eighth. Struck out Chase Dittmar and got Braden Murphy to pop out to third. He went 1-2-3 without consequence. And Devolge looking for his first hit of the season, which besides one other bench player hasn't gotten an at-bat today, every Rebel has a hit. That's so, cr it's crazy. It's crazy the fact that they've been able to get so many players in, but that they've all made an impact. Correct. So we're pulling for Cole here. And Devolge was really splitting the backup catcher role with Gavin Mez last year, so he got a number of plate appearances, so he is far from green when it comes to experience at the collegiate level. And batting with Andrew Kirshner behind him. We'll see what the defensive alignment is heading into the top half of the ninth inning. Kirshner figures to play first base unless they throw Andavolgi out there. They got a pitcher playing third, so anything's possible. As Andavolgi takes high, the junior out of L.A. listed at 6'1", 205 pounds. You know, last year limited at bats, but he had, you know, it's, a, it's a, that old adage, don't count the at bats, make the bat at bats count. And he was able to take advantage of a couple, and if I remember right, at, down at Dixie State, which is now Utah Tech. Utah Tech. Yeah. He had a really key hit with a home run as he gets curveball take right to the middle of the numbers in his back. Yeah, instead of hitting the ball, that ball hit him. And just taking a look at the, the games that he appeared in from last year. Yeah, that game at Dixie State, he recorded three RBIs on a three run jack. That was his only or one of two multi RBI games on the year, but Remember that one, he absolutely clubbed the home run and he appeared in the game, at, or one of the three games against Hawaii over at Las Vegas Ballpark as well. So here's Andrew Kirshner, one of two so far. He's had a couple of productive at-bats. Takes a called strike on a first pitch, fastball. Tomahawked a ball through the right side of the infield in the sixth, and then came around later in that inning and drove in a run on the ground out to first. So his first at-bat, not in the sixth inning, starts out nothing in one. Nothing in two now. He takes a fastball in on the kneecaps, and Kirshner, the biggest position player by far. This is a Rebel team that I think the most impressive thing about the way that the lineup is is that they don't have necessarily any big bruisers. They don't have a ton of guys that are going to win any bodybuilding contests. Well, I would I would disagree on one of them. Darian Williams, that guy, he, he, he's, he's strong. He's put together. He's gotten bigger, too, over the last five years. Correct. But overall, Kirshner, the, the most physically imposing of the position players, at least as of now. He swings and misses at strike three. So Kirshner down on strikes after Andavolgi hit to begin the inning. So one on, one down for Paul Myro, the shortstop. Now batting number so Myro, three. Charles, and Panaro, the three starters still in the lineup with Noah Rodriguez out on deck. Myro so far in six plate appearances has walked, been hit by a pitch. Two singles make it two walks, and he's also reached on an error. The on base percentage going to go up for Myro this afternoon, if nothing else. He takes a first pitch letter high fastball for a called strike one. And I think it's noteworthy to say that, you know, he's been a stalwart out at shortstop for us. He's, he's really been consistent in that hole there, and uh, he's made us better in the field. Oh, absolutely. And just. The position flexibility for a guy like Gianni Horvat to play a more natural second base has been huge already. This one's popped up first base side. The first baseman, Casagran, makes a nice over-the-shoulder catch and foul ground after fighting with the sun. That's a big one for out number two is Noah Rodriguez saunters into the right-hand batter's box. Rodriguez made a nice play to end the eighth inning after... A nice play in the seventh. Those are actually both off the bat of Jack Metro, the two really outstanding defensive plays that Rodriguez has made out in the field. And still looking for his first hit, he reached on an error and grounded out back to the mound. There's the first hit as he yucks that one into right field. Rounding second, heading towards third is going to be Ando Volge. So taking that extra base on the first college hit for Noah Rodriguez. And that'll wrap it back around to the top for Ryland Charles. This will be officially the eighth at-bat for Ryland. 
Yep, yeah, eighth, eighth plate appearance, and it, it is the eighth at bat, because he has two hits, make it three hits. He's grounded out, struck out, and reached on an error. One of the few spots in the lineup that hasn't taken a walk. UNLV has been walked 13 times today. They've been hit by two pitches as well. Eight bats in a ball game is something you dream of. Just to have the, the ample opportunity to do something as Charles crushes this one on a line down the right field side. It's fair. Rolling into the corner as Ando Volgi scores. Rodriguez zooming around second. He's into third. Into second with an extra base hit is Ryland Charles. It's his fourth hit in those eight plate appearances. It's his first double of the season. And that makes it a 28 to 6 tally. I think you're going to see a big smile from uh, Ryland after the game. He's been a little bit down on himself the last couple days. Just coming off the great year he had last year. And this is typical of what he can do day in and day out. 103 miles an hour, the exit velocity. That's the hardest hit ball that he's had over the weekend. He absolutely crushed that one towards right field on a line. He is a true line drive hitter. He's never going to hit any of those majestic soaring bombs. He's going to hit some line drives that climb as they oh, rise, just like of. this one. Absolutely hammered by Panaro. Turning around to watch it go as the right fielder graves. This ball's out of here. The first college home run for Santino Panaro is a three-run jack. And the Rebels into the 30s on top 31 to six. That ball was absolutely hammered down low in the zone. He went down and got it. Drove that over the Cox media sign out in right center and actually made it halfway up the tree, the pine tree that sits behind the fence. I don't recall any ball hit harder by Santino Panaro in his season last year and the first three games of this year. That was uh, pretty impressive by a little guy. He ran into that one, and that's putting it lightly. And that'll bring up Chase Gallegos with the bases empty and two down. I mean, we're talking football numbers here. 31 to six as the Rebels into the 30s for just the third time in school history. Yeah, this is uh, this is one of those games you you, you, you like to see, but it, it's hard to watch. It's hard to call. Xander Volgi, or rather Gallegos, crushes this one to left, although the left fielder settling in front, and Peterson's able to make the catch. Very nearly a home run, but Santino Panaro does record his first college home run. The Rebels continue to add on, looking to take care of business and close this one out 31-6, to six, top of the ninth inning when we come back. At the bottom of the eighth inning, four runs on three. It all comes down to this in the top of the ninth inning. Jack Selinger makes his Rebels debut, the Spring Valley High School product. The lefty at 6'3", 210 up against the middle third of this Pacific lineup. And he gets ahead with a called strike at 31 to, or with the score at 31 to six. Excited to see what Selinger can do. He uh, 
We need a lefty coming out of the bullpen that can throw with some velocity. Right now, he's showing it. And the one thing that was brought up by all the coaching staff when we talked to them about Selinger preseason was his slider. They absolutely love his breaking stuff from the left side. As he deals from the full wide here, that fastball pops sky high to shallow right field. Went back as the second baseman Rodriguez, called off by Santino Panaro. He makes the catch in what is ruled fair territory for out number one to begin the ninth. Yeah, again, we've had quite a few balls hit down in that kind of Bermuda Triangle about down there. And Panaro's done a good job of getting to almost every one of them. Salinger during that at bat, 92 to 93 on his fastball. So that's what you're going to get is a fastball in the mid-90s and an absolute hammer of a slider going from out to in to a right-handed batter like Peyton Miller. 31 runs on 22 hits for UNLV. It's just an anomaly. You don't, you don't see those numbers together in that order, typically. Or at all in the baseball no. field. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go back in the books on that one. And that ball is taken low and away from Selinger, even up the count of one and one. With Selinger facing off against Miller, who coming into the day was seven of eight in the series. He's 0 for today. He is the only spot in this lineup that has not reached base yet. That pitch outside from Selinger, two balls and a strike. Yeah, you talked about a slider coming in. He's thrown primarily fastballs so far. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, that slider comes into play on this pitch. High leg kick instead throws the fastball. Grounder to the second baseman Rodriguez. He turns and fires to first. And with that, Pacific down to their final out. Selinger coming in and taking care of business, but that's to be expected. This is what they thought they were getting. Yeah, and they're going to be looking early in the season to see who that guy is going to be coming out of the bullpen, whether it's going to be bullpen by committee or they got somebody that's a, considered a go-to guy. Well, especially as one of the four left-handers out of the pen. And you got Sharman, who's a starter. Rupp, who figures to be a multi-inning reliever this year. As far as the back end of the bullpen, they really don't have any southpaws. We'll see what we get out of Noah Matera and the role that they established for him. He figures to be more of a swing man in some extended innings. Yeah, and you may see Matera, you know, on a Tuesday night start or a Wednesday night start. Ground ball up the middle. Diving is the second baseman, Rodriguez. He can't get in front of it. That ball sneaks underneath him, and this game extends on Rylan Evans' third hit of the day, fourth time he's reached base. In fact, it's each of his last four plate appearances. And trying to extend this game further is Caden Casagrande. 31-6 tally in the top of the ninth inning. That ball not hit particularly hard right through the box. Uh, Salinger almost stuck his foot out, which we don't recommend. But it was able to get into the outfield for a Pretty much a, a soft single. Yeah, a roller. Good effort by Rodriguez. And there's the slider. The, right in on the hip, called for a strike. That thing is a tight breaker. Yeah, that's the pitch we're looking at right there. If he can command that pitch on a consistent basis, he's going to be tough. Well, and especially if you can throw that in on the back hip to a right-hander, that gives you just so much more effectiveness as a lefty. The fastball, it's fouled straight back, and down to their final strike of the Pacific Tigers. Count goes nothing and two. Caden Casagrande, who has made all four at-bats in the first base spot after Jacob Weiss all the way back in the second inning, involved in a collision with Paul Myro at first. Selinger trying to put the finishing touches, put a bow on this big-time opening series sweeping win. That fastball fought off the hands, knocked straight down and rolling towards the third base dugout. Caden Casagrande lives to see another one. You know, you mentioned that slider working in on the right-handed hitter. What that does is it just gets on their hands so quick they can't get that whip. They can't get their hands out in front. Because it's definitely not a curving action. It's definitely not a cutter. I mean, it is just a very tight slider with a lot of lateral horizontal break. See what he comes with on 0-2. It That's is the it slider. Right it's down the middle for a called strike three. And that'll wrap it up. A 31-6 final. I'll tell you what, that game only took three hours and 14 minutes for a combined 37 runs. Not too bad, all things considered, and the Rebels will absolutely take the result. A dominating three-game sweep of Pacific scores of 14 to 6, 8 to 3 in the grand finale on Sunday, 31 to 6. You know, that's great to watch. We, uh, we, we were talking pregame that with the lack of depth from the Tigers' bullpen, it might have been a game like this. Uh, but I, I will tell you that the effort and the thing that I liked seeing was all these pinch hitters that came in, they, they were stepped up to the plate and made some really good swings. And then you look at the, the freshman that came in to pitch and then closing with Selinger. I think it was a really good mix tonight. They're going to get back in the clubhouse. They're going to start watching some film. They're going to 
critique and evaluate where they are where they are right now going into a really tough stretch. And after going one of ten on Friday and Saturday, Ryland Charles with the game of the day going five for eight with four RBIs, three home runs, missed his first home run by a foot. You'll love the bounce back effort from the leadoff hitter. We knew it was coming. I talked to him. I was kidding him yesterday. Um, didn't talk to him this morning, kind of wanted to leave him alone, but uh, that's what we've come to expect from the leader in the clubhouse. A 31-6 final. Final line score of 31 runs on 27 hits. UNLV committed three errors and left 11 men on Pacific. Six runs, 11 hits, five defensive miscues, and 10 men left on. Joey Acosta moves to 1-0 with the win, giving up one run on six hits over five innings. Jake Tandy, the starter for Pacific, recorded one out and takes the loss. Four runs, two earned on two hits in a game that took three hours and nine minutes. Here is the UNLV Hustlin' Rebels defeat the Tigers of Pacific 31-6 to cap off the sweep. Your thoughts overall on a really impressive opening weekend? You know, it's a great start, right? You can't discount the fact that we put up a lot of runs. We saw some good pitching. But again, we're looking for that consistency and more importantly, the sustainability throughout the season. So with, with a good start like this, let's see what we do Tuesday night. Let's not do, get too far ahead of ourselves. Hopefully we'll be talking about this come Wednesday and then going into a really tough stretch down in San Diego next weekend. But it's a great day to be a Rebel. After an extended break away from the Earl UNLV's next home game March 1st against Grand Canyon. For Dan Dolby and everybody else here at UNLV Athletics, I'm Matt Never saying thank you for tuning in as the Rebels defeat the Pacific Tigers on a Sunday 31-6 to cap off the sweep.